Moody's Stories by Dwight L. Moody, narrated by David Neche. Lady Pendulum When Mr. Sankey and I were in London, a lady who attended our meetings was brought into the house in her carriage because she was unable to walk. At first she was very skeptical, but one day she said to her servant, Take me into the inquiry room. After I had talked with her a good while about her soul, she said, But you will go back to America, and it will all be over. Oh, no, said I, it is going to last forever. I couldn't make her believe it. I didn't know how many times I talked to her. At last I used the fable of the pendulum in the clock. The pendulum figured up the thousand of times it would have to tick and got discouraged and was going to give up. Then it thought, it is only a tick at a time, and went on. So it is in the Christian life, only one step at a time. This helped the lady very much. She began to see that if she could trust in God for a supply of grace for only one day, she could go right on in the same way from day to day. As soon as she saw this, she came out quite decided, but she never could get done talking about the pendulum. The servants called her Lady Pendulum. She had a pendulum put in her room to remind her of the illustration, and when I went away from London, she gave me a clock. I've got it in my house still. The Great Mystery Dr. Andrew Bonner once said that, although it was a mystery to him how sin should have come into the world, it was still a greater mystery how God should have come here to bear the penalty of it himself. Never runs dry. I remember being in a city where I noticed that the people resorted to a favorite well in one of the parks. I said to a man one day, Does the well never run dry? The man was drinking of the water out of the well, and as he stopped drinking, he smacked his lips and said, They have never been able to pump it dry yet. They tried it a few years ago. They put the fire engines to work. They tried all they could pump the well dry, but they found that there was a river flowing right under the city. Thank God the well of salvation could never run dry either. He trusted his father. A party of gentlemen in Scotland wanted to get some eggs from a nest on the side of a precipice, and they tried to persuade a poor boy that lived near them to go over and get them. They said that they would hold him by a rope. They offered him a good deal of money, but they were strangers to him, and he would not go. They told him that they would see that no accident happened to him. They would hold the rope. At last he said, I will go if my father will hold the rope. He trusted his father. A man will not trust strangers. I want to get acquainted with a man before I put my confidence in him. I have known God for forty years, and I have more confidence in him now than I have ever before. It increases every year. Peace declared. When France and England were at war, once a French vessel had gone off on a long whaling voyage. When they came back, the crew were short of water, and being near an English port, they wanted to get said water. But they were afraid that they would be taken prisoners if they went into the port. Some people in the port saw their signal of distress and sent word that they need not be afraid, that the war was over and peace had been declared. But they could not make those sailors believe it, and they didn't dare go into port although they were out of water. At last they made up their minds and that they had better go in and surrender their cargo and their lives to the enemy rather than perish at sea without water. And when they got in, they found out that what had been told to them was true, that peace had been declared. There are many people who don't believe the great tidings that peace had been made by Jesus Christ between God and man, but it is true. Sawdust or Bread if you go out to your garden and throw down some sawdust, the birds will not take any notice. But if you go down to your garden and throw down some crumbs, you will find that they soon sweep down and pick them up. A true child of God can tell the difference between sawdust and bread. Many so-called Christians are living on the world's sawdust instead of being nourished by the bread that cometh down from heaven. Nothing can satisfy the longings of the soul but the word of the living God. Babies feeding himself. 
You know, it is always regarded a great event in the family when a child can feed himself. It is propped up at a table, and at first perhaps it uses a spoon upside down, but by and by it uses it all right, and mother or perhaps sister claps her hands and says, Just see, baby is feeding himself. Well, what we need as Christians is to be able to feed ourselves. Now, many there are who sit helpless and listen with open mouths, hungry for spiritual things, and the minister has to try to feed them, while the Bible is a feast prepared unto which they never venture. Should not be postponed. In 1871, I preached a series of sermons in the Hall of Christ in Old Farewell Hall, Chicago, for five nights. I took him from the cradle and followed him up to the judgment hall, and, and on that occasion I consider I made as great a blunder as ever I have in my life. It was upon that memorable night in October, and the courthouse bell was sounding an alarm of fire, but I paid no attention to it. You know, we were accustomed to hear the fire bell often, and it didn't disturb us as much when it sounded. I finished the sermon upon the question, What shall I do with Jesus? and said to my audience, Now, I want you to take the question with you and think it over. And next Sunday, I want you to come back and tell me what you are going to do with him. What a mistake. It seems now as if Satan was in my mind when I said this. Since then, I never have dared give an audience a week to think of their salvation. If they were lost, they might rise up in judgment against me. Now is the acceptance time. I remember Mr. Sankey singing and how his voice rang when he came to that pleading verse, Today the Savior calls, for refuge fly, the storm of justice falls, and death is nigh. After the meeting, we went home. I remember going down La Salle Street with a young man and saw the glare of flames. I said to the young man, this means ruin to Chicago. About one o'clock, Farewell Hall was burned. Soon the church in which I had preached went down and everything was scattered. I never saw that audience again. My friends, we may not know what is going to happen tomorrow, but there is one thing I do know, and that is, if you take the gift of God, you are saved. If you have eternal life, you need not fear fire, death, or sickness. Let disease or death come, and you can shout triumphantly over the grave if you have Christ. My friends, what are you going to do with him? Will you not decide now? Teaching Willie Faith Some years ago, I wanted to teach my boy what faith was, and so I put him on a table. He was a little fellow about two years old, and I stood back two or three feet and said to him, Willie, jump. The, the little boy said, Papa, I'm afraid. I said, Willie, I will catch you. Just look right at me and jump. The little fellow got all ready to jump and then looked down again and said, I'm afraid. Willie, don't, didn't I tell you I will catch you? Will Papa deceive you? Now, Willie, look me right in the eyes and jump, and I will catch you. The little fellow got all ready to jump the third time, but he looked at the floor and said, I'm afraid. And I said to him, didn't I tell you I will catch you? Yes, he said. And at last, I said to him, Willie, don't take your eyes off me. And I held the little fellow's eyes and said, now jump, don't look at the floor. And he leaped into my arms. Then he said to me, let me jump again. I put him back and the moment he got on the table, he jumped. And after that, when he was on the table, I was standing five or six feet away. I heard him cry, Papa, I'm coming, and had just time to reach him and catch him. He seemed to put too much confidence in me, but you cannot put too much confidence in God. Act on your belief. When President Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation, copies of it were sent to all points along the northern line where they were posted. Now, suppose a slave should have seen a copy of that proclamation and should have learned of its contents. He might have known the fact, he might have assented to its justice, but if he had still continued to serve his old master as a slave, his faith in the documents would not have amounted to anything. And so it is for us, 
a mere knowledge of the historical events of Christ's life or a simple intellectual assent to his teachings and his mission would be of no help in a man's life unless he adds to them a trustful surrender to the Lord's loving kindness. 40 Miles to Liberty a friend of mine went to teach in Natchez before the war. He and a friend of his went out riding one Saturday in the country. And they saw an old slave coming, and they thought that they would have a little fun with him. They had just come to a place where there was a fork in the road, and there was a signed post which read, 40 miles to liberty. Sambo, how old are you? Uh, I don't know, Massa. I guess I'm about eight. Uh, can you read? No, sir, we, we don't read in this country. It's against the law. Uh, can you tell me what what's on that signpost? He said, yes, sir. It says 40 miles to liberty. Well, now, said my friend, why don't you follow that road and get your liberty? It says there, only 40 miles to liberty. Now, why don't you take that road and go there? The old man's countenance changed, and he said, that's a shame, young master, but if it pointed up there, and he raised his trembling hand towards heaven, to the liberty within Christ makes us free, that wouldn't be a shame. The old slave, with all his ignorance, had even then experienced a liberty in his own soul that these young men, with all their boasted education, at that time knew nothing of. The most important thing. A certain John Bacon, once a famous sculptor, left an inscription to be placed on his tomb in Westminster Abbey. It read, what I was as an artist seemed of some importance to me while I lived, but what I was as a believer in Christ is the only thing of importance to me now. Taking the Wrong Boat A Methodist minister, on his way to a camp meeting, through some mistake, took passage on the wrong boat. He found that instead of being bound for a religious gathering, he was on his way to the horse races. His fellow passengers were betting and discussing the events, and the whole atmosphere was foreign to his nature. He besought the captain that we stop his boat and let him off at the first landing, as the surroundings were so distasteful to him. The story also goes to tell how, on the same occasion, a sporting man, intending to go to the races, by some mistake found himself on the wrong boat that was bound for the camp meeting. The conversation around him was no more intelligible to him than that man in the first instance, and he too besought the captain to stop and let him off the boat. Now what was true in these two cases is practically true with every one. A true Christian is wretched where there is no fellowship, and a sinful man is not at ease where there are only Christians. A man's future will be according to what he is here prepared for. If he is sinful, heaven will have no attraction to him. Heaven is a prepared place for prepared people. The best proof. The highest proof of the infallibility of Scripture, said the late A.J. Gordon, is the practical one that we have proven it so, as the coin of the realm has always been found to buy the amount of its face value, so the prophecies and promises of Scripture have yielded their face value to those who have taken the pains to prove them. If they have not always done so, it is probable that they have not yet matured. There are multitudes of Christians who have so far proved the veracity of the Bible that they are ready to trust in it without reserve in all that it pledges for the world yet unseen and the life yet unrealized. Have faith. I remember a man telling me that he preached for a number of years without any results. He used to say to his wife as they went to church that he knew the people would not believe anything he said and there was no blessing. At last he saw his error. He asked God to help him and took courage, and then the blessing came. According to your faith, it shall be unto you. The man had expected nothing, and he got just what he expected. Dear friends, let us expect that God is going to use us. Let us show courage and go forward, looking to God to do great things. Chasing his shadow When I was a little boy, I tried to catch my shadow. I don't know if you were ever so foolish, but I always remember running after it and trying to get ahead of it. I could not see why the shadow always kept ahead of me. Once I happened to be racing with my face to the sun, and I looked over my head and saw my shadow behind me, and it kept behind me all the way. 
it is the same with the Son of Righteousness. Peace and joy will go with you while you go with your face towards Him. But those who turn their backs on the Son are in darkness all the time. Turn to the light of God and the reflection will flash in your heart. His Minister's Bible If I have a right to cut out a certain portion of the Bible, I don't know why one of my friends has not a right to cut out another and another friend to cut out another part, and so on. It would be a very queer kind of Bible if everyone cut out what he wanted to. Every adulterer would cut out everything about adultery. Every liar would cut out everything about lying. Every drunkard would cut out everything that he did not like. Once a gentleman took his Bible around to his ministry and said, That is your Bible. Why, why do you call it my Bible, said the minister. Well, replied the gentleman, I have been sitting under your preaching for five years, and when you say that a thing in the Bible was not authentic, I cut it out. He had about a third of the Bible cut out, all of Job, all Ecclesiastes and Revelations, and a good deal besides. The minister wanted him to leave the Bible with him. He did not want to rest of his congregation to see it, but the man said, Oh no, I have the covers left. I would hold on to them and off he went holding on to the covers. Mocked by his children When I was in St. Louis some years ago, there was an old man who had been away off in the mountains of an ungodly life, but in his early manhood he had known Christ. He came into the inquiry room literally broken down. About midnight that man came in trembling before God and was saved. He wiped away his tears and started home. Next night I saw him in the audience with a terrible look on his face. As soon as I finished preaching, I went to him and said, My good friend, you haven't gone back into the darkness again. Oh, Mr. Moody, it has been the most wretched day in my life. Why so? I asked him. Well, this morning, as soon as I got my breakfast, I started out. I have a number of children married in the city, and they have families. And I have spent the day going around and telling them what God has done for me. I tell them how I had tasted salvation, with the tears trickling down my face, and Mr. Moody, I hadn't a child that didn't mock me. That made me think of Lot down in Sodom. It is an awful thing for a man who has been a backslider to have his children mock him, but it is written, Thy backsliding shall reprove thee. Know therefore and see that it is an evil thing and bitter that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God. No need to read them. A great many people say that you must hear both sides. But if a man should write me a most slanderous letter about his wife, I don't think I would have to read it. I should tear it up and throw it into the winds. Have I to read all the infidel books that are written to hear both sides? Have I to take up a book that is a slander on my Lord and Master, who has redeemed me with his blood? Ten thousand times no, I will not touch it. Tolling the bell. I will remember how in my native village in New England it used to be customary, as a funeral procession left the church, for the bell to toil as many times as the deceased was years old. How anxiously I would count those strokes of the bell to see how long I might reckon on living. Sometimes there would be seventy or eighty tolls, and I would give a sigh of relief to think I had so many years to live. But at times there would be only a few years told, and then a horror would seize me as I thought that I too might soon be claimed as a victim to that dread monster, death. Death and judgment were a constant source of fear to me till I realized the fact that neither shall ever have any hold on a child of God. In his letter to the Romans, the Apostle Paul had showed in most direct language that there is no condemnation for a child of God, but that he is passed from under the power of law into the epistle of the Corinthians. He tells us, There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body, and as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. A Father's Neglect a story has gone around the American press that made a great impression upon me as a father. A father took his child into the field one Sabbath, and it being a hot day, he lay down under the beautiful shade of a tree. The little child ran about gathering wild flowers and little blades of grass and coming to his father saying, Pretty, pretty, 
At last the father fell asleep, and while he was sleeping, the little child wandered away. And when he woke, his first thought was, Where is my child? He looked around, but he could not see him. He shouted at the top of his voice, but all he heard was his own echo. Running to the little hill, he looked around and shouted again. No response. Then, going to a precipice at some distance, he looked down, and there, upon the rocks and briars, he saw the mangled form of his beloved child. He rushed to the spot, took up the lifeless corpse, and hugged it to his bosom, and accused himself of being the murderer of his child. While he was sleeping, his child had wandered over the precipice. I thought as I read that, what a picture of the Church of God. How many fathers and mothers, how many Christian men and women are sleeping now while their child wanders over the terrible precipice right into the bottomless pit. Father, mother, where is your boy tonight? Worth 10,000 men. Let us not give heed to gloomy and discouraging remarks. In the name of our great commander, let us march on to battle and to victory. There are some generals whose name alone is worth more than a whole army of 10,000 men. In our army in the Civil War, there were some whose presence sent a cheer all along the line. As they passed on, cheer upon cheer went up. The men knew who was going to lead them, and they were sure of having success. The boys liked to fight under such generals as that. Let us encourage ourselves in the Lord and encourage each other. Then we shall have good success. With or without power. Dr. Gordon of Boston used to say that as you passed along Washington Street of that city, or Broadway, New York, you might see stores with the card in the window that says to rent with or without power. And anyone could rent the store and by paying something extra can have power furnished from the engine in the rear. Dr. Gordon thought that it would be a good idea to ask men and women when they joined the church if they wanted to be a member with or without power, and if the latter to tell them that there were no vacancies in their church, for it already has too many members without power. Turning on the tap. A man who lived on the bank of Lake Erie had water pipes laid to his house from the lake and when he wanted water, all he had to do was turn the tap and water flowed in. If the government had presented him with the lake, he would not know what to do with it. So we may say that if God were to give us grace enough for a lifetime, we should not know how to use it. He has given us the privilege of drawing on him day by day, not forty days after sight. There's plenty of grace in the banks of heaven. We need not be afraid of it becoming exhausted. Keep close. The late Dr. Andrew Bonner once remarked in his own quaint fashion that it was always easy to trace the footprints of a person if we walked close behind him, but if we were some distance back, we might fail to find them. And accordingly, if we follow close after the master, we would easily see the way, but if we tried to follow afar, we would find it difficult to know the path of his will. On Both Knees William Dawson once told this story to illustrate how humble the soul must be before it can find peace. He said that at a revival meeting, a little lad, who was used to Methodist ways, went home to his mother and said, Mother, John so-and-so is under conviction and seeking for peace, but he will not find it tonight. Why, William, said she, be because he is only down on one knee, mother, and he will never get peace until he is down on both knees. Until conviction of sin brings us down on both knees, until we are completely humbled, until we have no hope in ourselves left, we cannot find the Savior. Something New A great many people seem to think that the Bible is out of date, that it's an old book, that it is past its day. They say it was very good for the Dark Ages and that there is some very good history in it, but it was not intended for the present time. We are living in a very enlightened age, and man can get on very well without it, that we have outgrown it. Now, you might as well just say that the sun, who has shown so long, is now old and out of date, that whenever a man builds a house, he need not put any windows in it, because we have newer light and a better light, we have gas light and electric light. 
there is something new, and I would advise people if that if they think the Bible is too old and worn now, that they build houses, not to put windows in them, but just to light them with electric light. That is something new, and that is what they are anxious for. Bidding Christ Farewell A rule I have had for many years is to treat the Lord Jesus Christ as a personal friend. It is not a creed, a merely empty doctrine, but it is Christ himself we have. The moment we receive Christ, we should receive him as a friend. When I go away from home, I bid my wife and children goodbye. I bid my friends and acquaintances goodbye. But I have never heard of a poor backslider going down on his knees and saying, I have been near you for ten years. Your service has become tedious and monotonous. I have come to bid you farewell. Goodbye, Lord Jesus Christ. I never heard of one doing this. I will tell you how they go away. They just run away. Anyone can believe. God has put the offer of salvation in such a way that the whole world can lay hold to it. All men can believe. A lame man might not perhaps be able to visit the sick, but he can believe. A blind man, by reason of his infirmity, cannot do many things, but he can believe. A deaf man can believe. A dying man can believe. God has put salvation so simply that young and old, wise and foolish, rich and poor, can all believe if they will. The wrath of God was on him. I heard of a rich man who was asked to make a contribution on behalf of some charitable object. The text that was quoted to him was, He that hath pity upon the poor lendeth unto the Lord, and that which he hath given will he pay him again. He said that the security might be good enough, but the credit was too long. The rich man died within two weeks. The war was ended. During the last days of the Civil War, when many men were deserting the Southern flag, Secretary Stanton sent out a notice from the War Department that no more refugees should be taken into the Union Army. A Southern soldier who had not seen that order came into the Union lines and they read it to him. He didn't know what to do. If he went back into the Southern Army, he would be shot as a deserter, and the Northern Army would not have him. So he went into the woods and stayed there, living on roots and whatever else he could find, until finally he was starving. One day he saw an officer riding by. He rushed out of the woods, caught the horse's bridle, and said that he would kill the officer if he did not help him. The officer asked what was the trouble, and he told him. But haven't you heard the news, said the officer. No, what news? Why, the war is over. Lee has surrendered and peace has been declared. Go into the nearest town and get all the food you want. The man waved his hat and went off as fast as he could. I want to say that peace has been declared between God and man. Be reconciled to God. The blood is on the mercy seat, and the vilest sinner can be saved for time and eternity. Nearer than he thought. I was reading some time ago of a young man who had just come out of a saloon, and he mounted his horse, and as a certain deacon passed on his way to church, he followed and said, Deacon, can you tell me how far it is to hell? The deacon's heart was pained to think that a young man like that should talk so lightly. But he passed on and said nothing. When he came round the corner to a church, he found that the horse had thrown that young man, and he was dead. You, too, may be nearer to judgment than you think. Its strength was underestimated. Some of the older people can remember when our Civil War broke out. Secretary Stewart, who was Lincoln's Secretary of State, a long-headed and shrewd politician, prophesied that the war would be over in 90 days, and young men in thousands and hundreds of thousands came forward and volunteered to go down to Dixie and whip the South. They thought that they would be back in 90 days, but the war lasted four years and cost about half a million lives. What was the matter? Why, the South was a good deal stronger than the North supposed. Its strength was underestimated. Jesus Christ makes no mistakes of that kind. When he enlists a man in his service, he shows him the dark side. 
he lets him know that he must live a life of self-denial. If a man is not willing to go to heaven by the way of Calvary, he cannot go at all. Many men want a religion in which there is no cross, but they cannot enter heaven that way. If we are to be disciples of Jesus Christ, we must deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow Him. So let us sit down and count the costs. Do not think that you will have no battles if you follow the Nazarene, because many battles are before you. Yet, if I had thousand lives, Jesus Christ would have every one of them. Men do not object to battles if they are confident that they will have victory. And thank God that every one of us may have victory if we will. Seeing the Gospel Have you ever heard the Gospel? asked a missionary of a Chinaman who he had not seen in his mission before. No, he replied, but I have seen it. I know a man who used to be a terror to his neighborhood. He was a bad opium smoker and dangerous as a wild beast, but he became wholly changed. He is now gentle and good and has left off of opium. Illuminated Christians We see very few illuminated Christians now. If every one of us was illuminated by the Spirit of God, how we could light up the churches. But to have a lantern without any light, that would be a nuisance. Many Christians carry along lanterns and say, I won't give up my religion for yours. They talk about religion. The religion that has no fire is like painted fire. They are artificial Christians. Do you belong to that class? You can tell, and if you can't, then your friends can't. There's a fable of an old lantern in a shed which began to boast because it had heard its master say that he didn't know what he would ever do without it. But the little candle within spoke up and said, Yes, you'd be a great comfort if it wasn't for me. You are nothing. I am the one who gives light. We are nothing, but Christ is everything, and what we want is to keep in communion with him and let Christ dwell in us richly and shine forth through us. I have a matchbox with a phosphorescent front. It draws in the rays of the sun during the day and then throws them out in the dead hours of the night so that I can always see it in the dark. Now, that is what we ought to be, constantly drawing in the rays of the sun of righteousness and then giving them out. Someone said to some of our young converts, It is all moonshine being converted. And they replied, Thank you for the compliment. The moon borrows light from the sun, and so we borrow ours from the sun of righteousness. That is what takes place when we have this illumination. Not ashamed of his Lord. A young convert tried to preach in the open air. He could not preach very well either, but he did the best he could. Someone interrupted him and said, Young man, you cannot preach. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. So the young man said, so I am, but I am not ashamed of my Lord. That is right. Do not be ashamed of Christ, of the man that bought us with his own blood. He silenced the devil. If you find yourself getting very miserly, begin to scatter like a wealthy farmer in New York State that I heard of. He was a noted miser, but he was soon converted. And soon after, a poor man who had been burned out and had no provisions left came to him for help. The farmer thought that he would be liberal and gave the man a ham from his smokehouse. On his way to get it, the tempter whispered to him, Give him the smallest one you have. He had a struggle whether he would give a large or small ham, but finally he took down the largest ham he could find. You are a fool, the devil said. If you don't keep still, the farmer replied, I will give him every ham I have in the smokehouse. Warm the Wax a gentleman in Ireland had a seal made for me. DLM is on one side, and on the other, God is love. If I want to stamp God is love, I would not make much headway if the wax were hard and cold. Many people go to meetings, and it is as hard to make an impression on them as in pressing a seal on hard wax. But let the wax be warmed up, and impression be made. If we are willing, every one of us may be sealed for the day of redemption. In him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Draw Near When I was a boy, my mother used to send me outdoors to get a birch stick to whip me with. 
when I had to be punished. At first, I used to stand off from the rod as far as I could, but I soon found that the whippings hurt me more that way than any other, and so I went as near to my mother as I could and found she could not strike me as hard. And so, when God chastens us, let us kiss the rod and draw as near to Him as we can. The panorama looks brighter. When a panorama is to pass before an audience, the artist darkens the room in which they sit so that the picture may be more fully seen. So, also God sometimes darkens our place on earth puts out this light and that, and then before our souls, he makes to pass the splendors and glories of the better land. All things work for good. There's one passage of scripture which has always been a great comfort for me. In the 8th chapter of Romans, Paul says, All things work together for good to those that love God. Some years ago, a child of mine had scarlet fever. I went to the druggists to get the medicine which the doctor had ordered and told him to be sure and very careful in making up the prescription. The druggist took down one bottle after another, in any one of which might have been something poisonous to my child, but he stirred them together and mixed them up and made just the medicine which my child needed. And so, God gives us a little adversity here, a little prosperity there, and all works together for good. It takes time. Suppose I should send my little boy, five years old, to school tomorrow morning, and when he comes home in the afternoon, say to him, Willie, can you read? Can you write? Can you spell? Do you understand all about algebra, geometry, Hebrew, Latin, and Greek? My papa, the little fellow, would say, How funny you talk. I have been all day trying to learn the ABCs. Suppose I should reply, If you have not finished your education, you need not go any more. What would you say? Why, you would have said that I have gone mad. There would be just as much reason in that as in the way that people talk about the Bible. The man who has studied the Bible for 50 years has never gone down to its depths yet. There are truths there that the Church of God has been searching about for the last 1900 years, but no man has yet fathomed the depths of the ever-living stream. Something God Cannot Do in Ireland, some time ago, a teacher asked the little boy if there is anything God cannot do. The little fellow said, Yes, he cannot see my sins through the blood of Christ. It seemed too good to be true. Some time ago, I read in one of the daily papers a thing that pleased me very much. When the new administration of President McKinley went into office, some clerks in one of the departments were promoted. One young lady was offered a promotion, but she went to see the secretary, General Butterworth, and said that there is a girl sitting next to her that had a family to support. A brother who had supporting the family had died or sickened, and it had fallen upon her, and she asked the general to let her friend that sat next to her to have the promotion in her place. The general said that he had heard of such things in other generations, but he didn't know that it would ever happen in his. He was amazed to find a person on duty in Washington that was willing to give up her position and take a lower one and let someone else have it that she might be able to help her family. In Colorado, the superintendent of some works told me of a miner that was promoted who came to the superintendent and said, There's a man that has seven children and I have only three and he is having a hard struggle. Don't promote me, but promote him. I know of nothing that speaks louder for Christ and Christianity than to see a man or woman giving up what you call your rights for others and in honor preferring one another. The Scarlet Thread In the British Navy, there is said to be a scarlet thread running through every line of cordage, and though a rope may be cut into inch pieces, it can still be recognized as belonging to the government. So, there is also a scarlet thread running all throughout the Bible. The whole book points to Christ. The First Don't Worry Club Mrs. Sangster said that we hear a good deal in this age, as if it were a novelty, about the futility of being anxious, and people have even established don't worry clubs.
But the first Don't Worry Club was begun by our blessed Lord Himself when He said, Take no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. He bade us consider the lilies growing in their beauty and purity without a thought and taught us the true ways of living without care, without solicitude, bearing all burdens lightly, and having continual joy in our faces. Only those who have the indwelling Christ in their hearts can walk through this world with bright and glad looks, because they know that, let come what may, their Father is leading them safely. The story followed him. While I was at a convention in Illinois, an old man past seventy years got up and said he remembered but one thing about his father, and that one thing followed him all throughout his life. He could not remember his death, he had no recollection of his funeral, but he recollected his father one winter night taking out a little chip and with his pocket knife whittling out a little cross, and with tears in his eyes he held up that cross, telling how God in his infinite love sent his son down here to redeem us, and how he had died on the cross for us. The story of the cross followed him throughout his life, and if we tell children these truths, they will never forget them. The Fatal Sleep Some time ago, a vessel had been off on a whaling voyage and had been gone about three years. The father of one of the sailors had charge of the lighthouse, and he was expecting his boy to come home. It was time for the whaling vessel to return. One night, there came up a terrible gale. His father fell asleep, and while he slept, his light went out. When he awoke, he looked towards the shore and saw a vessel had been wrecked. He at once went to see if he could not yet save someone who might still be alive. The first body that came floating towards the shore was, to his great grief and surprise, the body of his own boy. He had been watching for that boy for many days, and now the boy had come at last to the sight of home and had perished because his father had let his light go out. I thought, what an illusion of fathers and mothers today that have let their lights go out. You are not training your children for God in eternity. You do not live as though there were anything beyond this life at all. You keep your affection set upon things of this earth instead of the things of above. The result is that your children do not believe there is anything in Christianity. Perhaps the very next step they take may take them into eternity. The next day they may die without God and without hope. That love is spontaneous. Some time ago, in an inquiry meeting, I met a young miss who said that she could not love God, that it was very hard for her to love Him. And I asked her, Is it hard for you to love your mother? Do you have to learn to love her? She looked up through her tears and said, No, I can't help it. That is spontaneous. Well, I said, When the Holy Spirit kindles love in your heart, you cannot help loving God. It will be spontaneous. When the Spirit of God comes into your heart and mine, it will be easy to love and serve God. The Summing Up of His Life A man was taken into one of our insane asylums a few years ago from one of the western cities. He had resolved to be rich. How he had turned every stone to accumulate wealth. All his energy and every faculty were pushed towards that one end. Wealth, 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 money, money, money were his cry. At last it drove him mad, and they took him into a madhouse where he threw himself into a rocking chair and cried, millions of money and in a madhouse. That was all there was to his life. Pretty short, wasn't it? Sixty years gone, millions of money and in a madhouse, and he died there. That was the summing up of his life. Beautiful motion, but no progress. Many people are working and working, as Roland Hill said, like children on a rocking horse. It is a beautiful motion, but there is no progress. Those who are working for salvation are like men on a treadmill, going round and round and round, toiling and toiling, but nothing comes of it all. There is no progress. And there cannot be any until you have the motive power from within, till the breath of life comes from God, which can alone give you power to work for others. Get it into your heart. 
Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. An old Scotman said, It is a good thing in a good place for a good purpose. Many people have the Bible in their heads or in their pockets, but we need to get it down into our hearts. How the Miners Were Saved In the north of England, they have been digging for coal for centuries. They have gone miles and miles away from the shaft, under into the sea, and there's always a danger of men getting lost. I heard of two old miners who lost their way. Their lights went out, and they were in danger of losing their lives. After wandering for a long time, they sat down, and one of them said, Let us sit perfectly quiet and see if we cannot feel which way the air is moving, because it always moves towards the shaft. There they sat for a long time, when all at once one of them felt a slight touch on his cheek, and he sprang to his feet and said, I felt it. They went in the direction in which the air was moving and reached the shaft. Sometimes there comes a little breath from God that touches our souls. It may be so gentle and faint that you can barely recognize it, but if you do, do not disregard it. Thank God that he has spoken to you and praise him for it. And whatever may come, do not go into the opposite direction. Give yourself up and be led by it. And you will come out of the darkness, out of bondage, out of sorrow, and into perpetual light and joy. Receiving and never giving. What makes the dead see dead? Because it is all the time receiving, never giving anything out. Why is it that many Christians are cold? because they are all the time receiving and never giving anything out. Dumb Christians It is a very sad thing that so many of God's children are dumb, yet it is true. Parents would think of it as a great calamity to have their child born dumb. They would mourn over it and weep, and, well, they might, but did you ever think of the many dumb children God has? The churches are full of them. They never speak for Christ. They can talk about politics, art, and science. They can speak well enough and fast enough about the fashions of the day, but they have no voice for the Son of God. Like Siamese Twins Covetness and stealing are almost like Siamese twins. They go together so often. In fact, we might add lying and make them triplets. The covetous person is a thief in the shell. A thief is a covetous person out of his shell. Let a covetous person see something that he desires very much. Let an opportunity of taking it be offered. How very soon he will break through the shell and come out in his true character as a thief. The Greek word translated covetness means inordinate desire of getting. When the Gauls tasted the sweet wine of Italy, they asked where it came from and never rested until they had overrun the city. Not troubled with doubts. One of the happiest men I have ever seen was a man in Dundee, Scotland, who had fallen and broken his back when he was but a boy of fifteen. He had lain in his bed about forty years and could not move without a good deal of pain. Probably not a day had passed in all those years without acute suffering, but day after day the grace of God had been granted to him, and when I was in his chamber it seemed as if I was as near heaven as I could get on earth. I can imagine that when the angels passed over Dundee, they had to stop there and get refreshed. When I saw him, I thought that he might be beyond the reach of the tempter, and I asked him, doesn't Satan ever tempt you to doubt God and to think that he is a hard master? Oh, yes, he said. He does try to tempt me. I lie here and see my old schoolmates driving along in their carriages, and Satan says, If God is so good, why does he keep you here all these years? You might have been a rich man riding in your own carriage. Then I see a young man my own age walk by in perfect health, and Satan whispers, If God loved you, couldn't he have kept you from breaking your back? What do you do when Satan tempts you? I just take him to Calvary, and I show him Christ, and I point out those wounds in his hands and his feet and his sides, and I say, Doesn't he love me? And the fact is, he got such a scare there 1,800 years ago that he cannot stand it. He leaves me every time. That bedridden saint had not much trouble with doubts. He was too full of the grace of God. Honeydew 
I have sometimes been in a place where the very air seems to be changed with the breath of God, like the moisture in the air. I remember one time as I went through the woods near Mount Hermon School, I heard bees and I asked what it meant. Oh, said one of the men, they were after the honeydew, and I asked, what is that? And he took a chestnut leaf and told me to put my tongue to it. I did so, and the taste was as sweet as honey. Upon inquiry, I found that all up and down the Connecticut Valley, what they called honeydew had fallen, so that there would have been altogether hundreds of tons of honeydew in the region. Where it comes from, I do not know. Do you suppose that this earth would be worth living on if it were not for the dew and the rain? So, if the church that hasn't any of the dew of heaven, any of the rain that comes down in showers, will be as barren as the earth would be without the dew and the rain. A Personal Matter The life of Christianity, says Luther, consists of personal pronouns. It is one thing to say, Christ is a Savior. It is quite another to say, He is my Savior. The devil can say the first, but only a true Christian can say the second. They knew it. Let me tell you how I had my eyes open about the theater question. I had an assistant superintendent of a Sabbath school, a very promising young man who seemed to be very happy in the work. A star actor came to the city, and he went out to see him. I knew nothing of it, but the next Sunday, when he came into the Sunday school all over the building, boys cried out, Hypocrite! Hypocrite! The perspiration started out of every pore in my body. I thought that they were looking at me. I said to a little newsboy, Who are you calling a hypocrite? They mentioned the assistant's name. I asked the reason, and they said, We saw him going into the theater. I had never said anything about a theater to those children, but they saw that man going in, and they called him a hypocrite. They seemed to know it was no place for a Christian to go. He lost his influence entirely, withdrew from the school, and after a while gave up Christian work altogether. He was just swept along with the tide in Chicago, and his influence was lost. Pull for the shore. A vessel was wrecked off the shore. Eager eyes were watching, and strong arms manned the lifeboats. For hours they tried to reach that vessel through the great breakers that raged and formed on the sea banks, but it seemed impossible. The boat appeared to be leaving the crew to perish. But after a while, the captain and sixteen other men were taken off, and the vessel went down. When the lifeboat came to you, said a friend, did you expect that it had brought some tools to repair your old ship? Oh, no, was the response. She was a total wreck. Two of her masts were gone, and if we had stayed mending her only a few minutes, we would have gone down. When once off the old wreck and safe in the lifeboat, what remained for you to do? Nothing, sir, but just pull for the shore. Man cannot save himself. He has been wrecked by sin, and his only safety lies in taking Christ as his Savior. Easy and yet difficult. It is the easiest thing in the world to become a Christian, and it is also the most difficult. You may say that this is a contradiction and a paradox, but I will illustrate what I mean. A little nephew of mine a few years ago took my Bible and threw it down on the floor. His mother said, Charlie, pick up Uncle's Bible. The little fellow said that he could not. Charlie, do you know what that word means? She soon found out that he did and that he was not going to pick up the book. His will had come right up against his mother's will. I began to get quite interested in the struggle. I knew if she did not break his will, that he would some day break her heart. She repeated, Charlie, go and pick up Uncle's Bible and put it on the table. The little fellow said that he could not do it. I will punish you if you do not. He saw a strange look in her eye and the matter began to get serious. He did not want to be punished and he knew his mother would punish him if he did not lift the Bible. So he straightened every bone and muscle in him and said that he could not do it. I really believe that the little fellow had reasoned himself into believe that he could not do it. His mother knew that he was only deceiving himself, so she kept him right to the point. At last he went down, put his arms around the Bible, and tugged away at it. But he still could not do it. The truth was, he did not want to. He got up again without lifting it. The mother said, Charlie, I'm not going to talk to you anymore. This matter has been settled. Pick up that Bible or I will punish you. 
At last she broke his will, and then he found it as easy as it was for me to turn my hand. He picked up the Bible and laid it on the table. So it is with the sinner. If you are really willing to take the water of life, you can do it. No difference. During the war, when enlisting was going on, sometimes a man would come up with a nice silk hat on, leather boots, kid gloves, and a fine suit of clothes. And perhaps the next man who came along would be a hod carrier, dressed in the poorest kind of clothes. Both had to strip alike and put on the regimental uniform. When you come and say that you are not fit, haven't got good clothes, haven't got righteousness enough to be a Christian, remember that Christ will furnish you with the uniform of heaven, and you will be set down at the marriage feast of the Lamb. I don't care how black and vile your heart may be. Only accept the invitation of Jesus Christ, and he will make you fit to sit with the rest at the feast. Drawing a Comparison when I was in California, I went into a Sunday school and asked, Have you got someone who can write a plain hand? Yes, they said. So we got up the blackboard, and the lesson upon it proved to be the text, Lay upon for yourself treasures in heaven. I said, Suppose we write upon that board some of the earthly treasures. We will begin with gold. The teacher readily put down gold, and they could all comprehend it, for all had run to that country in hope of finding it. Well, we will put down house next, and then land, and next we will put down fast horses. They all understood what fast horses were. They knew a good deal more about fast horses than they knew about the kingdom of God. Some of them, I think, actually made fast horses serve as gods. Next, we will put down tobacco, and the teacher seemed to shrink at this. Put it down, said I. Many a man thinks more of tobacco than he does of God. Well, then we will put down rum. He objected to this, didn't like to put it down at all. Down with it. Many a man will sell his reputation, his home, his wife, his children, everything he has for rum. It is the God of some men. Many here are ready to sell their present and their internal welfare for it. Put it down. And down it went. Now, said I, suppose we put some of the heavenly treasures. Put down Jesus to the head of the list, and then heaven, then river of life, then crown of glory, and went on until the column was filled and then just drew a line and showed us heavenly and earthly things in contrast. My friends, they could not stand the comparison. If a man does that, he cannot but see the superiority of the heavenly over the earthly treasures. It turned out that this teacher was not a Christian. He had gone to California on the usual hunt, gold, and when he saw the two columns placed side by side, the excellence of one over the other was irresistible, and he was the first soul God gave me on that Pacific coast. He accepted Christ, and that man came into the station when I was coming away and blessed me for coming to that place. A Legend About Doves There is a beautiful legend about a conference held by the doves to decide where they should make their abode. One suggested that they should go into the woods, but the objection was made that there would be a danger from hawks. Another mentioned the cities, but boys would stone them there and drive them away or kill them. Presently, some doves suggested that they go and hide in the clefts of the rocks, and there they would be safe. O ye that dwell in Moab, leave the cities and dwell in the rocks, and be like the dove that maketh her nest in the side of the hole's mouth. Rock of ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. Look to Christ. A leading surgeon that I have heard of, when he had a bad wound to dress or a broken limb to set, tells the patient, Now, look at the wound, see just how it looks, and then look at me. So, when we have seen the state of your heart, look up to Christ and nowhere else. Paying Attention to the Preacher there was an architect in Chicago who was converted. In giving his testimony, he said that he had been in a habit of attending church for a great many years, but he could not say that he had really heard a sermon in all that time. He said that when the minister gave out the text and began to preach, he used to settle himself in the corner of the pew and work out the plans of some building. He could not tell how many plans he had prepared while the minister was preaching. He was the architect for one or two companies, and he used to do all his planning in that way. You see, Satan came in between him and the preacher, and caught away the good seed of the word. 
I have often preached to people and have been perfectly amazed to find that they could hardly tell one solitary word of the sermon. Even the text had completely gone from them. Better make sure. I have often heard folks say, I hope I have religion, but I'm not really sure. But I have never heard any man say, I hope I will get money, but I'm not sure about that. That sort of religion that you hope you will have it, but you're unsure of, isn't going to do any more good than money that you hope to have, but you're unsure of. Some things quite plain. An English army officer in India, who had been living an impure life, went round one evening to argue religion with the chaplain. During their talk, the officer said, Religion is all well, but you must admit that there are some difficulties, about the miracles, for instance. The chaplain knew the man and his besetting sin and quietly looked him in the face and answered, Yes, there are some things in the Bible, not very plain, I must admit, but the seventh, but the seventh commandment is very plain. Your own picture there. The Bible is like an album. I go into a man's house and while waiting for him, I take up an album and open it. I look at the pictures. Why, this looks like a man I know. I turn over and look at another. Well, I know that man. I keep turning over the leaves. Well, there's a man who lives on the same street as myself. And then I come upon another and see myself. My friends, if you read your Bible, you will find your picture there. It just describes you. You may be a Pharisee. If so, turn to the third chapter of John. See what Christ says to the Pharisee. Except a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. But you say, I am not a Pharisee, I am a poor, miserable sinner, too bad to come to him. Well, then turn to the woman of Samaria and see what Christ said to her. That's me. While we were in London, Mr. Spurgeon, one day in his orphanage, told about the boys, that some of them had aunts and some cousins, and that nearly every boy had some friends that took interest in him and came to see him and give him a little pocket money. One day, he said, while he stood there, a little boy came up to him and said, Mr. Spurgeon, let me speak to you. The boy sat down between Mr. Spurgeon and the elder who was with him and said, Mr. Spurgeon, suppose your father and mother were dead and you didn't have any cousins or aunts or uncles or friends to come and give you pocket money and give you presents. Don't you think you would feel bad? Because that is me. And Mr. Spurgeon said that the minute he heard that, he put his right hand down into his pocket and took out some money for him. Queer Ideas of Repentance The unconverted have a false idea about repentance. They think God is going to make them repent. I was once talking with a man on the subject, and he summed up his whole argument by saying, Moody, it has never struck me yet. I said, What has never struck you? Well, he said, some people it strikes and some it doesn't. There was a good deal of interest in our town a few years ago, and some of my neighbors were converted, but it didn't strike me. That man thought that repentance was coming down some day to strike him like lightning. Another man said he expected some sensation like cold chills down his back. Repentance isn't a feeling. It is turning from sin to God. One of the best definitions was given by a soldier. Someone asks him how he was converted, and he said, The Lord said to me, Halt, attention, right about face, march, and that was all there was in it. A good illustration. A little child gives a good illustration of faith. Let the wind blow her hat into a river, and she does not worry. She knows her mother will give her another one. She lives by faith. Come, come. Come. A man in one of our meetings had been brought there against his will. He had come through some personal influence brought to bear upon him. When he got to the meeting, they were singing the chorus of a hymn Come, O oh, come to me. Come, O oh, come to me. Weary, heavy laden, come, O oh, come to me. He said afterwards he thought he had never saw so many fools together in his life before. The idea of a number of men standing there singing, Come, come, come. When he started home, he could not get this little word out of his mouth. It kept coming back all the time. He went into the saloon and ordered some whisking, thinking to drown it. But he could not. It still kept coming back. 
He went into another saloon and drank some more whiskey, but the words kept ringing in his ears, Come, come, come. He said to himself, What a fool I am for allowing myself to be troubled in this way. He went to a third saloon, had another glass, and finally he got home. He went off to bed. He could not sleep. It seemed as if the very pillow was whispering, Come, come. He began to be angry with himself. What a fool I was for ever going to the meeting at all. When he got up, he took the little hymn book, found the hymn, and read it over. What nonsense, he said to himself, the idea of a rational man being disturbed by a hymn. He set fire to the book, but he could not burn the little word, come. He declared that he would never go to another one of the meetings, but the next night he came again. When he got there, strange to say, they were singing the same hymn. There is that same old miserable hymn again, he said. What a fool I am for coming. But when the Spirit of God lays hold of a man, he does a good many things that he does not intend to. To make a long story short, that man rose in the meeting of young converts and told the story that I have told you now. Pulling out the little hymn book, for he had bought another one, and opened it to the hymn, and he said, I think this hymn is the sweetest and best in the English language. God bless it for saving my soul, and yet this was the very hymn that I despised. Don't scold. He that winneth souls is wise. Do you want to win men? Do not drive or scold them. Do not try to tear down their prejudices before you begin to lead them to the truth. Some people think that they have to tear down the scaffolding before they begin on the building. An old minister once invited a young brother to preach for him. The latter scolded the people, and when he got home, asked the old minister how he had done. He said that he had an old cow, and when he wanted a good supply of milk, he fed the cow, but he did not scold her. A Long Time to Reap A man died in the Columbus Penitentiary some years ago who had spent over thirty years in his cell. He was one of the millionaires of Ohio. Fifty years ago, when they were trying to get a trunk road from Chicago to New York, they wanted to lay the line right through his farm near Cleveland. He did not want his farm divided by the railroad, so the case went into court, where commissioners were appointed to pay the damages and to allow the road to be built. One dark night, a train was thrown off the track and several people were killed. This man was suspected and was tried and found guilty and was sent to life in penitentiary. The farm was soon cut up into city lots and the man became a millionaire, but he got no benefit from it. It may not have taken him more than an hour to lay the obstruction, but he was over thirty years reaping the results of that one little act. As a little child A little child is the most dependent thing on earth. All of its resources are in its parents' love, all it can do is cry, and its necessities explain the meaning to the mother's heart. If we interpret its language, it means, Mother, wash me, I cannot wash myself. Mother, clothe me, for I am naked and cannot clothe myself. Mother, feed me, I cannot feed myself. Mother, carry me, I cannot walk. It is written, A mother may forget her sucking child, yet will not I forget thee. This is to receive the kingdom of God as a little child, to come to Jesus in our helplessness and say, Lord Jesus, wash me, clothe me, feed me, carry me, save me, Lord, or I perish. Rainsford Following the Lamb A friend who had lost all his children told me about being in an eastern country some time ago, and there he saw a shepherd going down to a stream, and this shepherd wanted to get his flock across. He went into the water and called them by name, but they came to the banks and bleated and were too afraid to follow. At last he went back, tightened his girdle about his loins, took up two little lambs and put one inside his frock and another inside his bosom. Then he started into the water, and the old sheep looked up to the shepherd instead of down into the water. They wanted to see their little ones. So he got them over the water and led them into the green pastures on the other side. How many times the good shepherd has come down here and taken a little lamb to the hilltops of glory, and then the father and mother begin to look up and follow. Two Pictures A friend told me of a poor man who had sent his son to school in the city. 
One day, the father was hauling some wood into the city, perhaps to pay his boy's bills. The young man was walking down the street with two of his school friends, all dressed in a very, all dressed in the very height of fashion. His father saw him, and he was so glad that he left his wood and went to the sidewalk to speak to him. But the boy was ashamed of his father, who had his old work clothes, and spurned him and said, I do not know you. Will such a young man ever amount to anything? Never. There was a very promising young man in my Sunday school in Chicago. His father was a confirmed drunkard, and his mother took to washing to educate her four children. This was her eldest son, and I thought that he was going to redeem the whole family. But one day a thing happened that made him go down in my estimation. The boy was in high school, and he was a very bright scholar. One day he stood with his mother at the cottage door. It was a poor house, but she could not pay for their schooling and feed and clothe her children and hire a very good house, too, out of her earnings. When they were talking, a young man from high school came up the street, and this boy walked away from his mother. Next day, the young man said, Who was that I saw you talking to yesterday? Oh, that was my washerwoman. And I said, Poor fellow, he will never amount to anything. That was a good many years ago. I have kept my eye on him. He has gone down, 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 and now he is just a miserable wreck. Of course he will go down. Ashamed of his mother that loved him and toiled for him and bore so much hardship for him. I cannot tell you the contempt I had for that one act. Let us look at a brighter picture. Some years ago, I heard of a poor woman who sent her boy to school and college. When he was to graduate, he wrote his mother to come, but she sent back word that she could not because her best skirt had already been turned once. She was so shabby that she was afraid he would be ashamed of her. He wrote back that he didn't care how she dressed and urged so strongly that she went. He met her at the station and took her to a nice place to stay. The day came of his graduation, and he walked down the broad aisle with that poor mother dressed very shabbily and put her into one of the best seats in the house. To her great surprise, he was the valedictorian of the class, and he carried everything before him. He won a prize, and when it was given to him, he stepped down before the whole audience and kissed his mother and said, Here, mother, here's the prize. It is yours. I would not have won it had it not been for you. Thank God for such a man. The Folly of Covetness The folly of covetness is well shown in the following extract. If you should see a man that had a large pond of water, yet living in continual thirst, not suffering himself to drink half a drop for fear of lessening his pond, if you should see him wasting his time and strength and fetching more water in his pond, always thirsty, yet always carrying a bucket of water in his hand, watching early and late to catch the drops of rain, gaping after every cloud and running greedily into every mire and mud in hopes of water, and always studying how to make every ditch empty itself into the pond, if you should see him grow gray in these anxious labors, and at last end a thirsty life by falling into his own pond, would you not say that such a person was not only the author of his own disquiet, but was foolish enough to be reckoning among a madman? But foolish and absurd as this character is, it does not represent half the follies and absurd disquiets of the covetous man. I have read of a millionaire in France who was a miser. In order to make sure of his wealth, he dug a cave in his wine cellar so large and deep that he could go down onto it in a ladder. The entrance had a door with a spring lock. After a time, he was missing. Search was made, but they could find no trace of him. At last his house was sold, and the purchaser discovered his door in the cellar. He opened it, went down, and found the miser lying dead on the ground, in the midst of his own riches. The door must have shut accidentally after him, and he perished miserably. What is needed? Nine-tenths, at least, of our church members never think of speaking of Christ. If they see a man perhaps a near relative, going right down to ruin, going rapidly, they never think of speaking to him about a sinful course and of seeking to win him to Christ. Now, certainly, there must be something wrong. And yet, when we talk with them, you find they have faith, and you cannot say that they are not children of God, but they have not the power, the liberty, the love that real disciples of Christ should have. 
a great many think that we need new measures, new churches, new organs, new choirs, and all these new things. But that is not what the Church of God needs today. It is the old power that the apostles had. If we have that in our churches, there will be new life. I remember when in Chicago many were toiling in the work, and it seemed as though the car of salvation didn't move on. But then a minister began to cry out from the depth of his heart, Oh God, put new ministers in every pulpit. Next Monday, I heard two or three men standing up and say, We had a new minister last Sunday. The same old minister, but he had gotten new power. And I firmly believe that is what we need today all over America new ministers in the pulpit, and new people in the pews. We want people quickened by the Spirit of God. Neglecting the Church A minister once rebuked a farmer for not attending church and said, You know, John, you are never absent from market. Oh, well, we must go to market, was the reply of the farmer. Oratorical Preaching my friends, we have too many orators in the pulpit. I am tired and sick of your silver-tongued orators. I used to mourn because I couldn't be an orator. I thought, oh, if I could only have the gift of speech like some men. I have heard men with a smooth flow of language take the audience captive, but they came and they went. Their voices were like the air. There wasn't any power behind them. They trusted in their eloquence and their fine speech. That is what Paul was thinking of when he wrote to the Corinthians. My speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Take a witness in court and let him try his oratorical powers in the witness box and see how quickly the judge will rule him out. It is the man who tells the plain, simple truth that has the most influence with the jury. Suppose that Moses had prepared a speech for Pharaoh, that he got his hair all smoothly brushed and had stood before the looking glass, or it had gone to an elocutionist to be taught how to make an oratical speech and how to make gestures. Suppose that he had buttoned his coat, put one hand on his chest, had stuck an attitude and begun, The God of our forefathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, had commanded me to come into the presence of the noble king of Egypt. I think that they would have taken his head right off. They had Egyptians who could be as eloquent as Moses. It was not eloquence that they wanted. To which class do you belong? Someone has said that there are three classes of peoples, the wills, the won'ts, and the can'ts. The first accomplishes everything, the second opposes everything, and the third fails in everything. Sunday Work A Christian man was once urged by his employer to work on Sunday. Does not your Bible say that if your ass falls into a pit on the Sabbath that you may pull him out? Yes, replied the other, but if my ass had a habit of falling in the same pit every Sabbath, I would either fill up the pit or sell the ass. There must be roots. Suppose I hire two men to set out trees, and after a day or two, I go out to see how they are getting along. I find that one man has set out a hundred trees, and the other only ten. I say, look here, what does this mean? This man has set out a hundred trees, and you have set out only ten. What does it mean? Yes, but he has cut off all the roots and just stick the tops into the ground. I go to the other man and say, What does this mean? Why have you planted all the trees without roots? I don't believe in roots. They are of no account. My trees look just as well as his. But when the sun blazes up the trees, they all wither and die. There are a lot of people running around who haven't got any roots. A good many live on negations. They are always telling what they don't believe. I want a man to tell me what he does believe, not what he does not. And I like to meet a positive man. I just want to know what men do believe. We don't want trees that haven't any roots, for they will dry up when the sun blazes on them. There are good many persons that are going on without any foundation. They have no faith. The Path of Obedience Whatsoever he tells you to do, do it. But be sure that he says it. Don't take your ideas. Go and live right. 
at home, go and treat your wife and children right, pay your debts, and do some things of that kind. A colored man said that he had seen a sign. He said it read, GPC, and he understood it to mean, Go Preach Christ. Another man got up and said, No, that's not what it means. It says, Go Pick Cotton. If it is to preach the gospel, go preach the gospel. And if it is to pick cotton, then go pick cotton. Calling a man a liar. You cannot offer a man a greater insult than to tell him that he is a liar. Unbelief is telling God that he is a liar. Suppose a man said, Mr. Moody, I have no faith in you whatsoever. Do you not think that it would grieve me? There is not anything that would wound a man more than to be told that you do not have any faith in him. A great many men say, Oh, I have profound reverence and respect for God. Yes, profound reverence, but not faith. Why, it is a downright insult. Suppose a man says, Mr. Moody, I have profound respect for you, profound admiration for you, but I do not believe a word you say. I wouldn't give much for his respect or admiration. I wouldn't say much for his friendship. God wants us to put faith in him. How it would wound a mother's feelings to hear a child say, I do love mama so much, but I don't believe what she says. How it would grieve that mother. And that is about a way a great many of God's professed children talk. Some men seem to think it a great misfortune that they do not have faith. Bear in mind that it is not a misfortune, but it is the damning sin of the world. Bending His Will A mother told me up in Minnesota that she had a little child who took a book and threw it out of the window. She told him to go and pick it up. The little boy said that he would not do it. She said, What? He said again, I won't. She said, You must go and pick up that book. He said that he couldn't do it. She took him out and she held him right to it. Dinner time came and he hadn't picked up the book. She took him to dinner and after it was over, she took him out again. They sat there until tea time. When tea time came, she took him in and gave him supper and then took him out and kept him there until bedtime. The next morning, she went out again and kept him there until dinner time. He found that he was in for a life job and he picked up the book. She said she never had any trouble with the child afterwards. Mothers, if you don't make your boy obey when he is young, he will break your heart when he is older. How to Find the Thirsty When preaching in Chicago, Dr. Monroe Gibson once asked in an inquiry meeting, now, how can we find out who is thirsty? I was just thinking how we could find it out. If a boy should come down the aisle bringing a good pail full of clear water in a dipper, we would soon find out who was thirsty. The thirsty man and woman would reach out for the water. But if he should walk down the aisle with an empty bucket, we would not find out. People would look in and see that there was no water and say nothing. So, he said... I think that there is reason that we are not more blessed in our ministry. We are carrying around empty buckets, and the people see that we have not anything in them, and they don't come forward. Making Parables Stuart Robertson met Marshall, the great politician, and Marshall said, Why don't you preach in parables like your master? Robertson said, I would if I knew enough. I wish you would make me a few. He never could get to see him from that day, until one day he met him on a corner and he said, Marshall, where are those parables? I knew you would be after me, but I gave it up. I tried, but I couldn't make them. I didn't know it was so hard. People often say, oh, anyone can make a sermon, but if you think so, just try it. A Father's Mistake The story is told that a man once said that he would not talk to his son about religion. The boy should be able to make his own choices when he grew up, unprejudiced by his father. The boy broke his arm, and when the doctor was setting it, he cursed and swore the entire time. The father was quite grieved and shocked. Ah, said the doctor, you are afraid to prejudice the boy in the right way, but the devil has no such prejudice. He has led your son the other way. The idea that a father is to let his children run wild. Nature alone never brings forth anything but weeds. A rum seller's son blows his brains out. Look at that rum seller. 
When we talk to him, he laughs at us. He tells you there is no hell, no future, there is no retribution. I've got one man in my mind now who has ruined nearly all the sons in his neighborhood. Mothers and fathers went to him, begging him not to sell their children liquor. He told him it was his business to sell liquor, and he was going to sell liquor to everyone who came. The saloon was a blot upon the place as dark as hell. But the man had a father's heart. He had a son. He didn't worship God, but he worshipped that boy. He didn't remember that whatever a man soweth he shall reap. My friends, they generally reap what they sow. It may not come immediately, but the retribution will surely come. If you ruin other men's sons, some other man will ruin yours. Bear in mind, God is a God of equity. God is a God of justice. He is not going to allow you to ruin others and escape yourself. If we go against his laws, we suffer. Time rolled on, and that young man became a slave to drink, and his life became such a burden to him that he went and put a revolver to his head and blew his brains out. The father lived a few years, but his life was as bitter as gall, and then went down to his grave in sorrow. Ah, oh, my friends, it is hard to kick against the pricks. Miss Moody teaching her child. There was a time when our little boy did not like to go to church and would get up in the morning and say to his mother, What day is tomorrow? Tuesday. How about the next day? And she would reply that it would be Wednesday, and so on till he came to the answer, Sunday. Dear me, he would say. I said to the mother, We cannot have our boy grow up to hate Sunday in this way. That will never do. That is the way I used to feel when I was a boy. I used to look upon Sunday with a certain amount of dread. Very few kind words were associated with the day. I didn't know that the minister even noticed me, unless it was that I was sleeping in the gallery and he would send someone to wake me. That kind of thing won't do. We must make the Sunday the most attractive day of the week, not a day to be dreaded, but a day of pleasure. Well, the mother took the work up with the boy. Bless those mothers in their work with the children. Sometimes I feel as if I would rather be the mother of John Wesley or Martin Luther or John Knox than have all the glories in the world. Those mothers who are faithful with the children God has given them will not go unrewarded. My wife went to work and took Bible stories and put those blessed truths in a light that the boy could comprehend. And soon his feeling for the Sabbath was the other way. What day is tomorrow, he would ask. Sunday. I am glad. If we make Bible truths interesting and break them up in some shape so that these children can get at them, then they will begin to enjoy them. Missed at last. In one of the tenement houses in New York City, a doctor was sent for. He came and found a young man very sick. When he got to the bedside, the young man said, Doctor, I don't want you to deceive me. I want to know the worst. Is this illness to prove serious? After the doctor had made an examination, he said, I'm sorry to tell you that you will not live out the night. The young man looked up and said, Well, then, I have missed it at last. Missed what? I have missed eternal life. I always intended to be a Christian some day, but I thought I had plenty of time and put it off. The doctor, who himself was a Christian man, said, Is not too late. Call on the Lord for mercy. No, I have always had a great contempt for a man who repents when he is dying. He is a miserable coward. If I were not sick, I would not have thought about my soul, but I am not going to insult God now. The doctor spent all day with him, read to him out of the Bible, and tried to get him to lay hold of the promises. The young man said that he would not call on God, and in this state of mind he passed away. Just as he was dying, the doctor saw his lips move. He reached down, and all he could hear was the faint whisper, I have missed it at last. Dear friends, make sure that you do not miss eternal life at last. Choose now. A teacher had been relating to her class the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, and he asked, Now, which would you rather be, boys, the rich man or Lazarus? One boy answered, I would rather be the rich man while I live and Lazarus when I die. But sadly, that cannot be. The Mansion Made Ready Once, when I was traveling to a city, there was a lady in a car with me. After I had reached the hotel where I was to stay and had got comfortable quarters, she came and said, Oh, sir, I cannot get a room at this hotel. They are quite full. How ever did you manage to get a room? 
Easily enough, I replied. I just telegraphed on before that I was coming to have a room ready for me. And it is similar in regard to gaining admission to heaven. Your names must be sent on beforehand and entered in its book, else you won't get in. But get your names inscribed on its pages, and then you won't be disappointed. God will have a mansion ready for you when you ascend to your heavenly home. When you come to its gates, the guardian angels will refer to the book of life to see if your name is there. If so, pass in. But if not, admittance will be inexorably refused. The Promise for All Every one of God's proclamations is connected with the word whosoever, whosoever believeth, whosoever will. I think it was Richard Baxter that said he thanked God for that whosoever. He would a good deal rather have that word whosoever than Richard Baxter, for if it was Richard Baxter, he should have thought it would be some other Richard Baxter who had lived and died before him. But whosoever, he knew, included him. I heard of a woman once that thought that there was no promises in the Bible for her. She thought the promises were for someone else, but not for her. There are a good deal many of these people in the world. They think it is too good to be true that they can be saved for nothing. This woman one day got a letter, and when she opened it, she found it was not for her at all. It was meant for another woman that had the same exact name, and she had her eyes open to the fact that if she should find some promise in the Bible directed to her name, she would not know whether it was meant for her or someone else that bore that name. But you know the word whosoever includes everyone in the whole wide world. Reaping as they sowed Although God forgave the sins of Jacob and David and the other Old Testament saints, there were still certain consequences of their sins which the saints had to suffer after they were forgiven. If a man gets drunk and goes out and breaks his leg so that it must be amputated, God will forgive him if he asks, but he will have to hop around on one leg all his life. A man may sow thistle seed with grain seed in the moment of peak against his master, and the master may forgive him, but the man will have to reap the thistle with the grain. Small Beginnings An obscure man preached one Sunday to a few persons in the Methodist chapel in the south of England. A boy of fifteen years of age was in the audience, driven into the chapel by a snowstorm. The man took as his text the words, Look unto me, and be ye saved. And as he stumbled along as best he could, the light of heaven flashed into the boy's heart. He went out of the chapel saved, and soon became known as Charles Spurgeon, the boy preacher. The parsonage at Epworth, England, caught fire one night, and all the inmates were rescued except one son. The boy came to a window and was brought safely to the ground by two farmhands, one standing on the shoulder of the other. The boy was John Wesley. If you would realize the responsibility of that incident, if you would measure the consequence of that rescue, ask the millions of Methodists who look back to John Wesley as the founder of their denomination. Saying and Doing A man was once conversing with a Brahmin priest, and he asked, Could you say, I am the resurrection and the life? Yes, replied the Brahmin priest, I could say that. But, asked the man again, can you make anyone believe it? Christ proved his superiority right there. His character and his actions were back of his words. He exhibited his divine power to silence his enemies. Climb Higher I remember being in a meeting after the Civil War had been going on for about six months. The Army of the North had been defeated at Bull Run. In fact, we had nothing but defeat, and it looked as though the Republic was going to pieces. So we were much cast down and discouraged. At this meeting, every speaker for a while seemed as if he had hung his harp upon the willow. It was one of the gloomiest meetings I have ever attended. Finally, an old man with beautiful white hair got up to speak, and his face literally shone. Young men, he said, you do not talk like the sons of God. Though it is dark just here, remember, it is light somewhere else. Then he went on to say that if it were dark all over the world, it was light up around the throne. He told us that he had come from the east, where a friend had described to him how he had been up a mountain to spend the night and see the sunrise. 
as the party were climbing up the mountain, and before they had reached the summit, a storm came on, and his friend said to the guide, I will give this up. Please take me back. The guide smiled and replied, I think we shall get over the storm soon. On they went, and it was not long before they got up to, to where it was calm as any summer evening. Down in the valley, a terrible storm raged. They could hear the thunder rolling and see the lightning flashing, but all was serene on the mountaintop. And so, my young friends, continued the old man, though all is dark around you, come a little higher and the darkness will flee away. Often when I have been inclined to get discouraged, I have thought of what he said. If you are down in the valley amidst the thick fog and the darkness, get a little higher. Get a little near to Christ and know more of him. The Greatest Miracle Jesus said, The work that I do shall ye do also, and greater works than these shall ye do, because I go to the Father. I used to stumble over that. I didn't understand it. I thought, what greater work can any man do than what Christ has done? How can anyone raise a dead man who had been laid away in a sepulcher for days and who had already begun to turn back to dust? How, with the word, could he call him forth? But the longer I live, the more I am convinced it is a greater thing to influence a man's will, a man whose will is set against God. To have that will broken and brought into subjugation to God's will? Or, in other words, it is a greater thing to have power over the living, sinning, God-hating man, than to quicken the dead. He who can create a world can speak a dead soul into life. But I think the greatest miracle this world has ever seen was the miracle at Pentecost. Here were men who were surrounding the apostles full of prejudice, malice, bitterness, their hands, as it were, dripping with the blood of Jesus Christ. And yet an unlettered man, a man whom they detested, a man whom they hated, stands up and preaches the gospel, and three thousand of them are immediately convicted and converted and become disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. Different Kinds of Murder one young man at college, an only son, whose mother wrote to him remonstrating against his gambling and drinking habits, took the letters out of the post office, and when he found that they were from her, he tore them up without reading them. She said, I thought I would die when I found I had lost hold of my only son. If a boy kills his mother by this conduct, you can't call it anything else than murder. He is truly guilty of breaking the sixth commandment as if he drove a dagger into her heart. It is not for you. Commenting on the text, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put into his own power, Spurgeon said, If I were introduced into a room where a large number of parcels were stored up, and I was told that there was something good for me, I should begin to look for that which had my name upon it. And when I came upon a parcel and saw in pretty big letters, it is not for you, I should leave it alone. Here then is a casket of knowledge marked. It is not for you to know the time or season which the Father had put into his own power. Cease to meddle with matters which are concealed, and be satisfied to know the things which are clearly revealed. Stolen Goods a Burden I once heard of a boy who stole a cannonball from a navy yard. He watched for his opportunity, snuck into the yard, and secured it. But when he had it, he hardly knew what to do with it. It was heavy and too large to conceal in his pocket, so he put it under his hat. When he got home with it, he dared not show it to his parents because that would have led to his detection. He said that after a few years, it was the last thing he ever stole. The story is told that a royal diamond valued 600,000 U.S. dollars was stolen from the window of a jeweler, to whom it has been given to set. A few months afterwards, a miserable man died a miserable death in a poor lodging house. In his pocket was found the diamond, and a letter telling how he had not dared to sell it, lest it should lead to his discovery and imprisonment. It never brought him anything but anxiety and pain. Unlocked by prayer. God's best gifts, like valuable jewels, are kept under lock and key. And those who want them most, with fervent faith, 
must ask for them, for God is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. The Faithful Promiser God is always true to what he promises to do. He made promises to Abraham, Jacob, Moses, Joshua, and the others, and did he not fulfill them? He will fulfill every word of what he has promised. Yet how few take him at his word. When I was a young man, I was a clerk in the establishment of a man in Chicago, whom I observe frequently occupied sorting and marking bills. He explained to me what he had been doing. On some notes he marked B, on some D, and others G. Those marked B, he told me, were bad. Those marked D meant they were doubtful, and those with G's on them meant that they were good. And said he, you must treat all of them accordingly. And thus people endorsed God's promises by marking some of them bad and others doubtful, whereas we ought to take them all as good, for he has never once broken his word, and all that he says he will do. Throw out the ballast. When men go up in a balloon, they carry with them what they call a ballast, that is, small bags of sand. And when they want to rise higher, they just throw out some of the sand. So we, if we want to rise near heaven, must just throw out some of the sand and cast aside every weight. We won't rise higher till we do. The closest tie on earth is a mother's love for her child. There are a good many things that will separate a man from his wife, but there isn't a thing in the wide, wide world that will separate a true mother from her own child. I will admit that there are unnatural mothers, that there are mothers that have gone out of their heads, mothers that are so steeped in sin and iniquity that they will turn against their own children. But a true mother will never, never turn against her own child. I have talked with mothers when my blood boiled with indignation against the sons for their treatment of their mothers, and I have said, Why don't you just cast him off? They have said, Why, Mr. Moody, I love him still. He is my son. I was once preaching for Dr. G. in St. Louis, and when I got through, he said that he wanted to tell me a story. There was a boy who was very bad, he had a very bad father who seemed to take delight in teaching his son everything that was evil. The father died and the boy went from bad to worse until he was arrested for murder. When he was on trial, it came out that he had murdered five other people, and from one end of the city to the other, there was a universal cry going up against him. During his trial, they had to guard the courthouse. The indignation was so intense. The white-haired mother got just as near her son as she could, and every witness that went into court and said anything against him seemed to hurt her more than her son. When the jury brought in a verdict of guilty, a great shout went up, but the old mother nearly fainted away, and when the judge pronounced the sentence of death, they thought she would faint away. After it was over, she threw her arms around him and kissed him, and there in the court they had to tear him from her embrace. She then went the length and breadth of the city trying to get men to sign a petition for his pardon. And when he was hanged, she begged the governor to let her have the body of her son that she might bury it. They say that death has torn down everything in this world, everything but a mother's love, that is stronger than death itself. The governor refused to let her have the body, but she cherished the memory of the boy as long as she lived. A few months later, she followed her boy, and when she was dying, she sent word to the governor and begged that her body might be laid close to her son. That is a mother's love. She wasn't ashamed to have her grave pointed out for all time as the grave of the mother of the most hated criminal in the state of Vermont. The prophet takes hold of that very idea. He says, Can a mother forget her child? But a mother's love is not to be compared to the love of God. Restitution I was preaching in British Columbia some years ago, and a young man came to me and wanted to become a Christian. He had been smuggling opium into the United States. Well, my friend, I said, I don't think there's any chance for you to become a Christian unless you make restitution. He said, if I attempt to do that, I will fall into the clutches of the law and will go to the penitentiary. 
Well, I replied, you had better do that than go to the judgment scene of God with that sin upon your soul and have eternal punishment. The Lord will be very merciful if you set your face to do right. He went away sorrowful, but came back the next day and said, I have a young wife and child, and all the furniture in my house I have bought with money I have got in a dishonest way. If I become a Christian, that furniture will have to go, and my wife will know it. Better let your wife know it, and better let your home and furniture go. Would you come up and see my wife? he asked. I don't know what she will say. I went up to see her, and when I told her, the tears trickled down her cheeks, and she said, Mr. Moody, I will gladly give everything if my husband can become a true Christian. She took out her pocketbook and handed over her last penny. He had a piece of land in the U.S., which he deeded over to the government. I do not know, in all my backward track, of any living man who has a better testimony for Jesus Christ than that man. He had been dishonest, but when the truth came to him that he must make it right before God would help him, he made it right. No amount of weeping over sin and saying that you feel sorry is going to help it unless you are willing to confess and make restitution. Willie and the Bears I said to my little family one morning, a few weeks before the Chicago fire, I'm coming home this afternoon to give you a ride. My little boy clapped his hands. Oh, Papa, will you take me to see the bears in Lincoln Park? Yes, I replied. I had not been gone long when my little boy said, Mama, I wish you would get me ready. Oh, she said, it will be a long time before Papa comes. But I want to get ready, Mama. At last, he was ready to have the ride, face washed and clothes all nice and clean. Now you must take good care and not get yourself dirty again, said Mama. Of course, he was going to take care. He wasn't going to get dirty. So off he ran to watch for me. However, it was a long time yet until the afternoon. And after a little while, he began to play. When I got home, I found him outside with his face all covered in dirt. I can't take you to the park that way, Willie. Why, Papa, you said that you would take me. Ah, but I can't. You're all covered in mud. I can't be seen with such a little boy. Why, I'm clean, Papa. Mama washed me. Well, you got dirty again. But he began to cry, and I could not convince him that he was dirty. I'm clean. Mama washed me, he cried. Do you think I argued with him? No. I just took him into my arms and carried him into the house and showed him his face in the looking glass. He had not a word to say. He would not take my word for it, but one look at the glass was enough. He saw it for himself. He didn't say he wasn't dirty after that. Now, the looking glass showed him that his face was dirty, but I did not take the looking glass to wash him. Of course not. Yet, that is just what thousands of people do. The law is the looking glass to see ourselves, to show us how vile and worthless we are in the sight of God. But they take the law and try to wash themselves with it, instead of being washed in the blood of the Lamb. Christ for All an old Welshwoman said that Christ was Welsh, and an Englishman said, no, he was a Jew. She declared that she knew he was Welsh because he spoke so that she could understand him. Starting right. Many a man is lost because he does not start right. He makes a bad start. A young man came from his country home and enters upon city life. Temptation arises and he becomes false to his principles. He meets with some scoffing, sneering man who jeers at him because he goes to church service or because he is seen reading his Bible or because he knows how to pray to God. And the young man proves to be weak need. He cannot stand the scoffs and the sneers and the jeers of his companions and so he becomes untrue to his principles and gives them up. I want to say here to young men, that when a young man makes a wrong start, in 99 cases out of 100, it is ruin to him. The first game of chance, the first betting transaction, the first false entry in the books, the first quarter dollar taken from the cash box or the till, the first night spent in evil company, either of these may prove the turning point. Either of these may represent a wrong start. Napoleon and the Conscript 
there's a well-known story told of Napoleon's the first time. In one of the conscriptions, during one of the many wars, a man was balloted as a conscript who did not want to go, but he had a friend who offered to go in his place. His friend joined the regiment in his name and was sent off to the war. By and by a battle came on in which he was killed, and they buried him in the battlefield. Some time after, the emperor wanted more men, and by some mistake the first man was balloted a second time. They went to take him, but he remonstrated. You cannot take me. Why not? I am dead, was the reply. You are not dead, you are alive and well. But I am dead, he said. Why, man, you must be mad. Where did you die? At such a battle, and you left me buried on such a battlefield. You talk like a madman, they cried, but the man stuck to his point that he had been dead and buried some months. Look up your books, he said, and see if it is not so. They looked, and they found that he was right. They found the man's name entered as drafted and sent to war and marked off as killed. Look here, they said. You didn't die. You must have gotten someone to go for you. It must have been your substitute. I know that, he said. He died in my stead. You cannot touch me. I died in that man, and I go free. The law has no claim against me. They would not recognize the doctrine of substitution, and the case was carried to the emperor. He said the man was right, that he was dead and buried in the eyes of the law, and that France had no claim against him. This story may or may not be true, but one thing I know is true. Jesus Christ suffered death for the sinner, and those who accept him are free from the law. Green Fields or Desert When I was out in California, the first time I went down from the Sierra Nevada mountains and dropped into the valley of Sacramento, I was surprised to find on one farm that everything about it was green. All the trees and flowers, everything was blooming, and everything was green and beautiful. Just across the hedge, everything was dried up, and there was not a green thing there. I could not understand. I made inquiries, and I found that the man that had everything green irrigated. He just poured the water right on. He kept everything green, while the fields that were next to his were as dry as Gideon's fleece without a drop of dew. So, it is with a great many in the churches today. They are like these farms in California, a dreary desert, everything parched and desolated, and apparently no life in them. They can sit next to a man who is full of the Spirit of God, who is like a green bay tree, and who is bringing forth fruit, and yet they will not seek a similar blessing. Well, why this difference? Because God has poured water on him that was thirsty. That is the difference. One has been seeking this anointing, and he has received it. And when we want this above anything else, God will surely give it to us. Religion in the Home What we want is family piety, righteousness in our homes. A young minister came to me and said he couldn't get along with his wife and what should he do? I told him to get out of the ministry. A man has no right to be in the pulpit unless he can get along with his family. A universal failing. It is a false idea that all pride is confined to the upper classes. You will find it in the lanes and the alleys. You will find little dirty, barefooted children who will get a string of shavings, put it round their neck, and strut down the street as if they were wearing golden beads. Pride is born and grows in the human heart. You do not plant it there, it grows there itself. There is as much pride among the poor as among the rich, and that is one reason why more of them do not come to the Lord Jesus Christ. They do not like to be laughed at, scoffed at, sneered at, and ridiculed. It costs them too much. Words and Actions A man may preach with the eloquence of an angel, but if he doesn't live what he preaches and act out in his home and his business what he professes, his testimony goes for naught and the people say it is all hypocrisy after all. It is all a sham. Words are very empty if there is nothing back of them. Your testimony is poor and worthless if there is not a record back of that testimony consistent with what you profess. 
What we need is to pray to God to lift us up out of that low, cold, formal state that we live in, that we may dwell in the atmosphere of God continually, and that the Lord may lift upon us the light of His countenance, and that we may shine in this world reflecting His grace and glory. The One-Eyed Doe there's an old fable that a doe that had but one eye used to graze near the sea, and in order to be safe, she kept her blind eye towards the water, from which side she expected no danger, while with the good eye she watched the country. Some men, noticing this, took a boat and came upon her from the sea and shot her. With her dying breath she said, O oh, hard fate, that I should receive my death wound from that side whence I expected no harm, and be safe in the part where I looked most for danger. Lost Opportunities If a farmer neglects to plant in the springtime, he can never recover the lost opportunity. No more can you if you neglect yours. Youth is a seed time. And if it is allowed to pass without good seed being sown, weeds will spring up and choke the soil. It will take bitter toil to uproot them. An old divine said that when a good farmer sees a weed in his field, he has to pull it up. If it is taken early enough, the blank is soon filled in, and the crop waves over the whole field. But if allowed to run too late, the bald patch remains. It would have been better if the weed had never been allowed to get root. Steer Clear A steamboat was stranded in the Mississippi River, and the captain could not get her off. Eventually, a hard-looking fellow came on board and said, Captain, I understand you want a pilot to take you out of this difficulty. The captain said, Are you a pilot? Well, they call me one. Do you know where the snags and sandbars are? asked the captain. No, sir, replied the fellow. Well, how do you expect to take me out of here if you don't know where the snags and sandbars are? I know where they aren't, was the reply. Beware of temptations. Lead us not into temptation, our Lord taught us to pray. And again he said, Watch and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. We are weak and sinful by nature. It is a good deal better for us to pray for deliverance rather than to run into temptation and then pray for strength to resist. Looking for Revivals Men are anxious for a revival in business. There's a great revival in politics just now. In all departments of life, you find that men are very anxious for a revival in things that concern them most. If this is legitimate, and it is perfectly right in its place, should not every child of God be praying for and desiring a revival of godliness in the world at the present time? Do we not need a revival of downright honesty, of truthfulness, of uprightness, and of temperance? Are there not many of those who have become alienated from the church of God, and from the house of the Lord, who are forming an attachment to the saloon? Are not our sons being drawn away by hundreds and thousands so that while you often find the churches empty, the liquor shops are crowded every Sabbath afternoon and evening? I'm sure the saloon keepers are glad if they can have a revival in their business. They do not object to sell more whiskey and beer. Then surely every true Christian ought to desire that men who are in danger of perishing eternally should be saved and rescued. Opportunity. A sculptor once showed a visitor his studio. It was full of statues of gods, and one was very curious. The face was concealed by being covered with hair, and there were wings on each foot. What is his name? said the visitor. Opportunity, was the reply. Why is his face hidden? Because men seldom know him when he comes to them. Why has he wings on his feet? because he is soon gone, and once gone can never be overtaken. It becomes us, then, to make most of the opportunities God has given us. The Usual Way I used to, at one time, read so many chapters of the Bible a day, and if I did not get through my usual quantity, I thought I was getting cold and backsliding. But mind you, if a man had asked me two hours afterwards what I had read, I could not tell him. I had forgotten everything I read. 
When I was a boy, I used to, among other things, hoe corn on a farm, and I used to hoe it so badly in order to get over so much ground that at night I had to put down a stick in the ground so as to know next morning where I had left off. That is somewhat in the fashion as running through so many chapters every day. A man will say, Wife, did I read that chapter? Well, says she, I don't remember. And neither of them can recollect, and perhaps he read the same chapter over and over again, and they call that studying the Bible. I do not think that there is a book in the world we neglect as much as the Bible. Getting on splendidly. One man said to another some time ago, How are you getting on at your church? Oh, splendid. Many conversions? Well, on that side we're not getting on so well. But, he said, we have rented all our pews and are able to pay all our running expenses. We are getting on splendidly. That is what the godless call getting on splendidly. They rent the pews, pay the minister, and meet all the running expenses. A man was being shown through one of the cathedrals of Europe. He had come in from the country. One of the men belonging to the cathedral was showing him around, and when he inquired, Do you have many conversions here? Many, many what? Many conversions here. Ah, man, this is not a Wesleyan chapel. The idea of there being conversions there. And you can go into a good many churches in this country and ask if they have many conversions there, and they would not know what it meant. They are so far away from God. They are not looking for conversions and do not expect them. A hundred years hence. Once, as I was walking down the street, I heard some people laughing and talking aloud. One of them said, Well, there will be no difference. It will all be the same a hundred years hence. A thought flashed across my mind. Will there be no difference? Where will you be in a hundred years? Young man, just ask yourself, where shall I be? Some of you who are getting on in years may be in eternity ten years hence. Where will you be? on the left or the right hand of God. I cannot tell your feelings, but I can my own. I ask you, where will you spend eternity? Where will you be a hundred years hence? A free gift. Remember, salvation is a free gift, and is a free gift for us. Can you buy it? It is a free gift presented to whosoever will accept it. Suppose I were to say, I will give the Bible to whosoever will take it. What have you got to do? Why, nothing but take it. But a man comes forward and says, I'd like that Bible very much. Well, didn't I say whosoever can have it? Yes, but I'd like to have you mention my name. Well, here it is. Still, he keeps eyeing the Bible and saying, I'd like to have that Bible, but I'd like to give you something for it. I don't like to take it for nothing. But I'm not here to sell Bibles. Take it, if you want. Well, I want it, but I'd like to give you something for it. Let me give you a cent for it, though, to be sure, it's worth about five dollars. Suppose I accept the cent. The man takes up the Bible and marches away home with it. His wife asks, where did you get that Bible? Oh, I bought it. Mark the point. When he gives the penny, it ceases to be a gift. So with salvation. If you were to pay ever so little, it would not be a gift. What seed are you sowing? Suppose I meet a man who is sowing seed and say, Hello, stranger, what are you sowing? And he replies, Seed. What kind of seed are you sowing? Well, I don't know. Don't you know whether it is good or bad? No, I can't tell, but it is seed, and that is all I want to know, and I am sowing it. You would say that he's a first-class lunatic, but he wouldn't be half so mad as the man who goes on sowing for time and eternity and never asks himself what he is sowing or what the harvest will be. Father, what seed are you sowing in your family? Are you setting your children a good or bad example? Do you spend your time at the saloon or club until you have become almost a stranger to them? Or are you training them for God and righteousness? Bound hand and foot. When I was speaking to 5,000 children in Glasgow some years ago, I took a spool of thread and said to one of the largest boys, Do you believe I can bind you with this thread? 
He laughed at the idea. I wound the thread around him a few times, and he broke it with a single jerk. Then I wound the thread around and around, and by and by, and I said, Now get free if you can. He could not move head or foot. If you are slave to some vile habit, you must either slay that habit, or it will slay you. Unity There's one thing I have noticed as I have traveled in different countries. I never yet have known the Spirit of God to work where the Lord's people were divided. Unity is one thing that we must have if we are to have the Holy Spirit of God work in our midst. If a church is divided, the members should immediately seek unity. Let the believers come together and get the difficulty out of the way. If the minister of a church cannot unite the people, if those that are dissatisfied will not fall in, it would be better for that minister to retire. I think there are a good many ministers in this country who are losing their time. They have lost, some of them, months and years. They have not seen any fruit, and they will not see any fruit, because they have a divided church. Such a church cannot grow in divine things. The Spirit of God doesn't work where there is division. And what we want today is the spirit of unity amongst God's children, so that the Lord may work. Get inside. You have looked at the windows of a grand church erected at the cost of many thousands of dollars. From the outside they do not seem very beautiful, but get inside when the rays of the sun are striking upon the stained glass and you begin to understand what others have told you of their magnificence. So it is also when you have come into personal contact with Christ. You find Him to be the very Savior and friend you need. You will see in Him what you have never seen before. Hunt for something. We must study the Bible thoroughly and hunt it through, as it were, for some great truth. If a friend were to see me searching about a building and were to come up and say, Moody, what are you looking for? Have you lost something? And I were to say, No, I haven't lost anything. I'm not looking for anything in particular. I fancy he would just let me go on by myself and think me very foolish. But if I were to say, yes, I have lost a dollar, why, then I might expect him to help me find it. Read the Bible, my friends, as if you were seeking for something of value. It is a good deal better to take a single chapter and spend a month on it than to read the Bible at random for a month. When Ye Think Not McShane, the Scotch preacher, once said to some friends, Do you think Christ will come tonight? One after another they said, I think not. When all had given this answer, he solemnly repeated the text, The Son of Man cometh at an hour when ye think not. Home Piety If a Christian is unsound in patience or unsound in love, we take no notice of it. But let him be unsound in faith, and off goes his head. I do hate to see a minister or professing Christian mean and peevish to his wife, and yet be as polite as a dance master to other women. I tell you, he's not fit to preach the word of God. I don't want to have anything to do with him. The home was established before the church, and he sadly needs more home piety. Constant Watching the Persians had an annual festival where they slew all the serpents and venomous creatures that they could find, but they allowed them to swarm as fast and freely as ever until the festival came round once more. It was a poor policy. Sins, like serpents, breed quickly and need to be constantly watched. The Wrong Physician I heard once of a man who went to England from the continent and brought letters with him to eminent physicians from the emperor. The letter said, This man is a personal friend of mine, and we are afraid he is going to lose his reason. Do all you can for him. The doctor asked him if he had lost any dear friends in his own country or any positions of importance or what it was that was weighing on his mind. The young man said, No, but my father and grandfather and myself were brought up infidels, and for the last two or three years this thought has been haunting me. Where shall I spend eternity? And the thought of it follows me day and night. The doctor said, You have come to the wrong physician, but I will tell you of the one who can cure you. 
and he told him of Christ and read to him the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. With his stripes we are healed. The young man said, Doctor, do you believe that? The doctor told him that he did, and prayed and wrestled with him, and at last the clear light of Calvary shone in his soul. He had settled the question in his own mind at last, where he would spend eternity. I ask you, sinner, to settle if now. It is for you to decide. Shall it be with the saints and martyrs and prophets, or in the dark caverns of hell amidst blackness and darkness forever? Make haste to be wise, for how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Seeking the Lost I remember when we were in London, they found one old woman who was 85 years old and not a Christian. After the worker had prayed, she made a prayer herself. O Lord, I thank Thee for going out of Thy way to find me. He is all the time going out of his way to find the lost. He got time to think. I was once preaching on the text, Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. No sooner had I read it than a man stood up in the audience and said, I don't believe it. I said, My friend, that doesn't change the fact. Truth is truth, whether you believe it or not, and lie is a lie, whether you believe it or not. He didn't want to believe it. When the meeting broke up, an officer was at the door to arrest him. He was tried and sent to the penitentiary for twelve months for stealing. I really believe that when he went to his cell, he believed that he had to reap what he had sowed. The Motherless Child Once I heard of a little sick child whose mother was seriously ill, and so, in order that she might have quiet and that the sick child might be no trouble to her, the little one was taken away to a friend's house and placed in charge of a kind lady for a time. The mother grew worse, and at length she died. The father said, We'll not trouble the child about it. She's too young to remember her mother. Just let her remain where she is until the funeral is over. This was done, and in a few days the little girl was taken back to her house. No mention was made of her mother or of what had occurred, but no sooner was she taken to the house than she first ran into one room, then into another then into the parlor, and then into the dining room, and all over the house, and then away into a little room where her mother used to go to pray alone. Where's mother? She cried. I want mother. And then they were compelled to tell her what happened. She cried out, Take me away, take me away. I don't want to be here without mother. It was the mother who made it home for her, and so it is in heaven. It is not so much the white robes, the golden crown, or the harps of gold, but it is the society that we meet there. Who then are there? What company shall we have when we get there? Jesus is there, the Holy Father is there, and the Spirit is there. Our Father, our Elder Brother, and our Comforter. Converted the Regular Way I never yet knew a man converted just in the time and manner he expected to be. I have heard people say, Well, if I ever am converted, it won't be in a Methodist church. You won't catch me there. I never knew a man say that, but at last, if converted at all, it was in a Methodist church. In Scotland, a man was converted at one of our meetings. An employer. He was very anxious that all his employees should be reached, and he used to send them one by one to the meetings but there was one employee that wouldn't come. We are all more or less troubled with stubbornness, and the moment this man found that his employer wanted him to go to the meetings, he made up his mind, and he wouldn't go. If he was going to be converted, he said, he was going to be converted by some ordained minister. He was not going to any meeting that was conducted by unordained Americans. He believed in conversion, but he wasn't going to be converted the regular way. He believed in the regular Presbyterian Church of Scotland, and that was the place for him to be converted. The employer tried every way he could to get him to attend the meetings, but he wouldn't come. After we left that town and went up to Inverness, the employer had some business up there, and he sent his employee to attend it, in the hopes that he would attend some of our meetings. One night, as I was preaching on the banks of a river, I happened to take from the text of the words of Naaman, I thought, I thought. I was trying to take men's thoughts up and show the difference between their thoughts and God's thoughts. 
This man happened to be walking along the banks of the river. He saw a great crowd and heard someone talking, and he wondered to himself what the man was talking about. He didn't know who was there, so he drew up to the crowd and listened. He heard the sermon and became very convicted and converted right there. Then he inquired who was the preacher, and he found out that it was the very man that he said that he would not hear, the man he disliked. The very man he had been talking against was the man God used to convert him. Crazy from Sin I was once preaching in Chicago, and a woman who was nearly out of her mind came to me. You know that there are some people who mock at religious meetings and say that religion drives people mad. It is sin that drives people mad. It is the want of Christ that sinks people into despair. This is the woman's story. She had a family of children. One of her neighbors had died and her husband had brought home a little child. She said, I don't want the child, but her husband said, you must take it and look after it. She said she had enough to do with her own and she told her husband to take the child away, but he would not. She confessed that she tried to starve the child, but it lingered on. Once it cried all night. I suppose it wanted food. At last she took the clothes and threw them over the child and smothered it. No one saw her. No one knew anything about it. The child was buried. Years had passed away and she said, I hear the voice of that child day and night. It has driven me mad. No one saw the act, but God saw it. And this retribution followed it. History is full of these things. You need not go to the Bible to find it out. Don't swear. I was greatly amazed not long ago in talking to a man who thought that he was a Christian to find that once in a while, when he got angry, he would swear. I said, my friend, I don't see how you can tear down with one hand what you are trying to build up with the other. I don't see how you can profess to be a child of God and let those words come out of your lips. He replied, Mr. Moody, if you knew me, you would understand. I have a very quick temper. I inherited it from my father and mother and is uncontrollable, but my swearing comes only from the lips. When God said, I will not hold him guiltless that takes my name in vain, he meant what he said, and I don't believe anyone can be a true child of God who takes the name of God in vain. The True Sheep Knows I tell you, the true sheep knows a true shepherd. I got up in Scotland once and quoted a passage of scripture a little different from what it was in the Bible, and an old woman crept up and said, Mr. Moody, you said so and so. I might make forty misquotations in an ordinary audience and no one would tell me about them. Like two lawyers, one said in court that the other didn't know the Lord's Prayer. The other said he did. Now I lay me down to sleep. Well, the first said, I give it up. I did not think you knew it. Didn't either one of them know it, you see? The Father Knew Best Dr. Arnott, one of the greatest Scotch divines, was in this country before he died. His mother died when he was a little boy, only three weeks old, and there was a large family of Arnott's. I suppose they missed the tenderness and love of the mother. They got the impression that their father was a very stern and rigid, and that he had a great many laws and rules. One rule was that no child should ever climb trees. When the neighbors found out that the Arnott child could not climb trees, they began to tell them about the wonderful things they could see from the tops. Well, tell a boy of twelve years that he mustn't climb a tree, and he will get up that tree some way. And so, the Arnott children were all the time teasing their father to let them climb the tree. But the old sire said, no. One day he was busy reading the papers, and the boy said, Father's reading his papers. Let's slip down into the lot and climb a tree. One of the little fellows stood on the top of the fence to see their father did not catch them. When his brother got up on the first branch, he said, What do you see? Why, I don't see anything. Then go higher. You haven't gotten high enough. So up he went higher, and again the little boy asked, Well, what do you see now? I don't see anything. Well, you aren't high enough. Go higher. The little fellow went up as high as he could, but he slipped, and down he came and broke his leg. Willie said he tried to get him into the house, but he couldn't do it. He had to tell his father all about it. He said he was scared nearly out of his wits. He thought his father would be very angry. But his father just threw aside the paper and started for the lot. When he got there, he picked up the boy in his arms and brought him up into the house. Then he sent for the doctor. And Willie said he got a new view on this father. He found out the reason why that father was so stern. 
He said the moment that boy got hurt, no mother could have been more loving and gentle. My dear friends, there is not one commandment that has been given to us which has not been for our highest and best interest. There isn't a commandment that hasn't come from the loving heart of God. And what He wants is to have us give up that which is going to mar happiness in this life and in the life to come. Help Yourself When I was out on the Pacific Coast in California some years ago, I was the guest of a man who had a large vineyard and a large orchard. One day he said to me, Moody, while you are my guest, I want you to make yourself perfectly at home, and if there's anything in the orchard or in the vineyard you would like, help yourself. Well, when I wanted an orange, I did not go to an orange tree and pray the oranges fall into my pocket, but I walked up to a tree, reached out my hand, and took the oranges. He said, Take, and I took. God says, This is my son. Take him as your savior. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. The Rich Husband There was a shop girl in Chicago a few years ago. One day, she could not have bought five dollars worth of anything. The next, she could go and buy a thousand dollars worth of whatever she wanted. What made the difference? Why, she had married a rich husband. That was all. She had received him, and of course all he had became hers. And so we can have all if we only receive Christ. Settle it now. Some years ago, in one of the mining districts of England, a young man attended one of our meetings and refused to go from the place till he had found peace in our Savior. The next day, he went down into the pit and the coal fell in upon him. When they took him out, he was broken and mangled, and he had only two or three minutes of life left in him. His friends gathered about him, saw his lips moving, and bending down to catch his words, heard him say, It is a good thing I settled it last night. Settle it now, my friends, once and for all. Begin now to confess your sins and pray the Lord to remember you. He will make you an heir of his kingdom if you will accept the gift of salvation. The True Source of Joy God doesn't ask us to rejoice over nothing. He gives us a ground for our joy. What would you think of a man who seems very happy today and full of joy and couldn't tell you what made him so? Suppose I meet a man on the street, and he was so full of joy that he should get a hold of both of my hands and say, Bless the Lord, I am so full of joy. What makes you so full of joy? Well, I don't know. What do you mean you do not know? No, I don't, but I am so joyful that I just want to get out of my flesh. What makes you feel so joyful? Well, I don't know. Would you not think such a person unreasonable? There are a great many people who want to feel that they are Christians before they are Christians. They want the Christian experience before they can become Christians. They want to have the joy of the Lord before they receive Jesus Christ. But this is not the gospel order. He brings joy when He comes, and we cannot have joy apart from Him. He is the author of it, and we find our joy in Him. The Meanest Kind of Murders when I was in England in 1892, I met a gentleman who claimed that they were ahead of us in the respect that they had for the law. We hang our murderers, he said. There isn't one out of twenty in your country that is hung. I said, you are greatly mistaken, for they walk about these two countries unhung. What do you mean, he asked me. I will tell you what I mean, I said. The man that comes into my house and runs a dagger into my heart for my money is a prince compared with a son that takes five years to kill me and the wife of my bosom. A young man who comes home night after night drunk and when his mother remonstrates, curses her gray hairs and kills her by inches is the blackest kind of murder. Where Your Treasure Is you can soon tell where a man's treasure is by his talk. If it is in heaven, he will not be long with you before he's talking about heaven. His heart is there, and so his speech isn't long and running there too. If his heart is in money, he will soon have you deep in talk about mines, speculations, stocks, bank rate, and so on. If his heart is in land, it won't be long before he's talking about real estate, improvement, houses, and so on. Always the same. Wherever a man's heart is, there his tongue is also. Someone in England said, If you see a man's good and furniture come down by the luggage train, 
You're pretty sure he'll be down by the next passenger train. He won't be long after. He'll follow his goods. And so it is with heaven. If your treasure is on before you, you'll be wanting to follow it. You'll be glad to be on the road thither as soon as possible. Why his life was spared Two Americans who were crossing the Atlantic met on Sunday night to sing hymns in the cabin. As they sang the hymn, Jesus, lover of my soul, one of them heard an exceedingly rich and beautiful voice behind him. He looked around, and although he did not know the face, he thought that he recognized the voice. So when the music ceased, he turned around and asked the man if he had not been in the Civil War. The man replied that he had been a Confederate soldier. Were you at such a place on such a night? asked the first. Yes, he said, and a curious thing happened that night. This hymn recalled into my mind. I was on sentry duty on the edge of a wood. It was a dark night and very cold, and I was a little frightened because the enemies were supposed to be very near at hand. I felt very homesick and miserable, and about midnight, when everything was very still, I was beginning to feel weary and thought that I would comfort myself by praying and singing a hymn. I remember singing this hymn. All my trust in thee is stayed, all my help from thee I bring. Cover my defenseless head with the shadow of thy wing. After I had sung those words, a strange peace came down upon me, and through the long night I remember having felt no more fear. Now, said the other men, listen to my story. I was a Union soldier and was in the woods that night with a party of scouts. I saw you standing up, and my men had their rifles focused upon you, waiting for the word to fire. But when you sang out, Cover my defenseless head with the shadow of thy wing, I said, Boys, put down your rifles, we will go home. I couldn't kill you after that. The Sinner's Heart When I was in Dublin some years ago, I got up to go to an early meeting and found that the servant had not opened the front door. So I pulled back a bolt, but I still could not get out. Then I turned a key, but the door would not open. Then I found that there was another bolt at the top and another bolt at the bottom. Still the door would not open. Then I found there was a bar, and I found a night lock. In all, I found five or six different fastenings. I am afraid that door represents every sinner's heart. The door of his heart is double locked, double bolted, and double barred. Oh, my friends, pull back the bolts and let the King of Glory in. Nothing small. There are a great many different ways of doing good. A lady once visited a hospital and noticed with what pleasure the patients would smell and look at the flowers sent to them. She said, if I had known that a bunch of flowers would do so much good, I would have sent some from home. As soon as she got home, she sent some flowers out of her garden. It was a little thing, a bouquet of flowers. It might be very insignificant work, but if it was done in the right spirit, God accepted it. A cup of water given in His name is accepted as given to Himself. Nothing that is done for God is small. An Anecdote About Tennyson It is said that Tennyson once asked an old Christian woman if there was any news. Why, Mr. Tennyson, she replied, there's only one piece of news that I know, and that is Christ died for all men. That is old news and good news and new news, Tennyson responded. On Satan's Ground There's a legend that the Apostle John was much distressed over the fall of a young convert. He summoned Satan before him and reproached him for ruining such good a youth. I found your good youth on my ground, said Satan, so I took him. The only safe course is to avoid temptation altogether. Two bidding for the soul. There are two who are bidding for your soul and mine, the Lord Jesus and Satan. Satan bids and he offers that which he cannot give. He is a liar and has been from the foundation of the world. I pity the man who is living on the promises of the devil. He will never satisfy himself. But the Lord Jesus is able to give all that he offers. And what does he offer? He offers peace and joy and comfort that the world knows not of. He offers eternal life in the kingdom of God. He offers a seat in His mansions. We are to sit with Him upon His throne. May God help you to make the right choice. Make up your mind. 
you will not rest until the great question of eternity is settled, until you have crossed the borderlands and pressed into the kingdom of God. Tried and Proven I know an old lady that marked in the margins of her Bible, opposite the promises, T and P. T for tried and P for proven. What we want is to try the Bible and see if it is not true. The Prairie Fire Out in the western country, in the autumn, when men go hunting, and there has not been any rain for months, sometimes the prairie grass catches fire, and there comes up a very strong winds, and the flames just roll along twenty feet high and travel at the rate of thirty or forty miles an hour, consuming both man and beast. When the hunters see it coming, what do they do? They know they can't run as fast as the fire can. Not the fastest horse can escape. They just take a match and light the grass around them and see the flames sweep, and then they get into the burnt district and stand safe. They hear the flames roar as they come along. They see death coming towards them, but they do not fear. They do not tremble because the fire has swept over the place where they are, and there is no danger. There is nothing for the fire to burn. There's one mountain that the wrath of God has swept over, that is, Mount Calvary, and the fire spent its fury upon the bosom of the Son of God. Take your stand by the cross, and you will be safe for time and eternity. Perfect Order A good many people are afraid of doing anything out of the regular lines, of doing anything out of order. Now, you would find perfect order in a cemetery, you will find perfect order where there is death. Where there is life, you will find something out of order. Is your soul insured? Pa, said a little boy as he climbed to his father's knees and looked into his face as earnestly as if he understood the importance of the subject. Pa, is your soul insured? What are you thinking about, my son? replied the agitated father. Why do you ask that question? Why, Pa, I heard Uncle George say that you had your house insured and your life insured, but he didn't believe you had thought about your soul, and he was afraid you would lose it. Won't you get it insured right away? The father leaned his head on his hand and was silent. He had owned broad acres of land that were covered with bountiful produce. His barns were even now filled with plenty. His buildings were all well covered by insurance and, as if that would not suffice for the maintenance of his wife and only child, in the case of his decease, he had, the day before, taken a life policy for a large amount. Yet, not one thought had been given to his own immortal soul. On that which was to waste away and become part and parcel of its native dust, he had spared no pains, but for that which was to live on and on throughout the long ages of eternity, he made no provision. What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and yet lose his own soul? Memory I have been twice at the point of death. I was drowning once, and just as I was going down the third time, I was rescued. In the twinkle of an eye, my whole life came flashing across my mind. I cannot tell you how it was. I cannot tell you how a whole life can be crowded into a second of time, but everything I had done from my earliest childhood, it all came flashing across my mind. And I believe that when God touches the secret spring of memory, every one of our sins will come back. And if they have not been blotted out by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, they will haunt us as eternity rolls in. We talk about our forgetting, but we cannot forget if God says remember. We talk about that recording angel keeping the record of our lives. I have an idea that when we go into heaven or into eternity, we'll find that recording angel has been ourselves. God will make every one of us keep our own record. These memories will keep the record. And when God shall say, Son, remember, it will flash across our minds. It won't be God who will condemn us. It will be ourselves. We shall condemn ourselves and we shall stand before God speechless. There's a man in prison. He has been there for five years. Ask that man what makes the prison so terrible to him. Ask him if it is the walls and the iron gates. Ask him if it is his hard work, and he will tell you no. He will tell you that what makes the prison so terrible to him is memory. And I have an idea that if we got down into the lost world, we would find that is what makes hell so terrible. The remembrance that they once heard the gospel, 
that they once had Christ offered to them, that they once had the privilege of being saved, but they made light of the gospel. They neglected salvation. They rejected the offer of mercy. And now, if they would accept it, they could not. Balaam's ass. A friend of mine was going back to Scotland, and he heard a couple of these little modern philosophers discussing the Bible. One said, The Bible says that Balaam's ass spoke. Now I am a scientific man, and I have taken the pains to examine an ass's mouth, and it is so formed that it cannot speak. He was going to toss the whole Bible over because Balaam's ass couldn't speak. My friend said he stood it just as long as he could, and finally said, Ah, man, you make an ass, and I will make him speak. The idea that God, who made the ass, couldn't speak through his mouth. Did you ever hear of such things? And yet, this was one of your modern philosophers. The Border Apple Tree If you want real peace and rest to your soul, keep separate from the world. I remember when I was a boy in Northfield, right near the old red schoolhouse, there was an apple tree that bore the earliest apples of any tree in town. They had a law in that town that fruit on a tree overhanging the street belonged to the public, and any fruit on the other side of the fence belonged to the property holders. Half that apple tree was over in the street, and it got more old brooms and brick bats and handles than any other tree in town. We boys used to watch and see when an apple was getting red. I never got a ripe apple from that tree in my life, and I don't believe anyone else ever did. You never went by that tree that you didn't see a lot of broom handles and clubs up there. Now, take a lot of Christians who want to live right on the line, with one foot in the world and one foot in the church. They get more clubs than anyone else. The world clubs them. They say, I don't believe in that man's religion. And the church clubs them. They get clubs on both sides. It is a good deal better to keep just as far from the line as you can if you want power. Bad Company A friend of mine said that he had a beautiful canary bird. He thought it was the sweetest singer that he had ever had. Spring came on, and he felt that it was a pity to keep the poor bird in the house. So, he put it under a tree right in front of his house. He said before he knew it, a lot of these little English sparrows got under that tree. And you know that they cannot sing any more than I can, and I don't know one note from another. And went, chirp, chirp, chirp. Before he knew it, that little canary had lost all its sweet notes. It had gotten into bad company. After he found out that he had made his mistake, he took the bird into the house, but it kept up that chirp, chirp, chirp. He brought another bird, but the canary nearly ruined it. He said that the bird never got back its sweet notes. Now, don't you know lots of Christian people who have a fine testimony several years ago, but they have lost their witness, and all they do now is talk, talk, talk. Why? Because they are out of communion with God and have lost their witness. Hitch on and cut behind. Someone tells of an incident that happened in a New England town the other day. All the boys were slaying. A big sleigh, we call it Pung up there, was being driven through the streets by an old man who looked like Santa Claus. He was calling out to the small boys to hitch on, for the Pung is like a bus. It always holds one more. There were already about 20 boys hitched on when one fellow dropped off behind. He tried but couldn't catch up again, and pretty soon he began to look up for another chance for a ride. A man's sleigh was standing nearby, and the boy began to eye him. When the man in the sleigh started off, the little fellow hitched on behind, and the man grabbed his whip and struck him directly in the eye. It looked as if his eye had been put out, but it wasn't. Now, that is the way we go through this world. Some say, hitch on, hitch on. Others say, cut behind. The hitch on people fill the churches, and the cut behind ones empty them. Known by name. A friend of mine was in Syria, and he found a shepherd that kept up the old custom of naming his sheep. My friend said he wouldn't believe that the sheep knew him when he called them by name. So he said to the shepherd, I wish you would just call one or two. The shepherd said, Carl. The sheep stopped eating and looked up. The shepherd called out, Come here. The sheep came and stood looking up into his face. He called another and another, and there they were standing looking up at the shepherd. How can you tell them apart? Oh, they're no two alike, 
See, that sheep toes in a little. This sheep is a little bit squinty-eyed. That sheep has a black spot on its nose. My friend found out that he knew every one of his sheep by their failings. He didn't have a perfect one in the flock. I suppose that is the way the Lord knows you and me. There's a man that is covetous. He wants to grasp the whole world. He wants a shepherd to keep down that spirit. There's a woman down there who has an awful tongue. She keeps the whole neighborhood stirred up. There's a woman over there who's deceitful, terribly so. She needs the care of a shepherd to keep her from deceit, for she will ruin all her children. They will all turn out just like their mother. There's a father over there who won't swear for all the world before his children, but sometimes he gets provoked in his business and swears before he knows it. Doesn't he need a shepherd's care? I would like to know if there's a man or woman on the earth who doesn't need the care of a shepherd. Haven't we all got failings? If you really want to know what your failings are, you can find someone who can point them out. God would never have sent Christ into the world if we didn't need his care. We are as weak and foolish as sheep. The Right Time for Action A man was always telling his servant that he was going to do a great thing for him. I am going to remember you in my will. Sambo got his expectations up very high. When the man came to die, it was found that all he had willing Sambo was to be buried in the family lot. That was a big thing, you know. Sambo said he wished that he had given him ten dollars and let the lot go. If you want to show kindness to a person, show it to him while you are living. I heard a man say that he didn't want people to throw bouquets to him after he was dead and say, there, smell them. Now, this is the time for action. I have got so tired and sick of this splitting hairs over theology. Man, let us go out and get the fallen up. Lift them up towards God in heaven. We want a practical kind of Christianity. Criticizing the Sermon Very often a man will hear a hundred good things in a sermon, but there may be one thing that strikes him a little out of place, and he will go home and sit down at the table and talk right out before his children and magnify that one wrong thing and not say a word about the hundred good things that were said. That is what people do who criticize. A reminiscence. I remember blaming my mother for sending me to church on the Sabbath. On one occasion, the preacher had to send someone into the gallery to wake me up. I thought it was hard to have to work in the field all week and then be obliged to go to church and hear a sermon that I didn't understand. I thought that I wouldn't go to church anymore when I got away from home, but I had got so in the habit of going that I couldn't stay away. After one or two Sabbaths, back again to the house of God I went. There I first found Christ, and I have often said since, Mother, I thank you for making me go to the house of God when I didn't want to go. Transplanting the Lily It is easy to go when the time comes. There are no ropes thrown out to pull us ashore. There are no ladders let down to pull us up. Christ comes and takes us by the hand and says, You have had enough of this. Come up higher. Do you hurt a lily when you pluck it? Is there any rudeness when Jesus touches the cheek and the red rose of health whitens into a lily of immortal purity and gladness? Talmadge. Election. How many men fold their arms and say, If I am one of the elect, I will be saved, and if I ain't, I won't. No use of your bothering about it. Why don't some of these merchants say, If God is going to make me a successful merchant in Chicago, I'll be one whether I like it or not. And if he isn't, I won't. If you are sick and the doctor prescribes for you, don't take the medicine. Throw it out the door. It does not matter, for if God has decreed you are going to die, you will. And if he hasn't, you will get better. If you use that argument, you may as well not walk home from the tabernacle. If God had said you're going to get home, then you'll get home. You will fly through the air. I have an idea that the Lord Jesus saw how men are going to stumble over this doctrine. So, after he had been thirty or forty years in heaven, he came down and spoke to John. One Lord's Day in Patmos, he said to him, Write these things to the churches. John kept on writing. 
His pen flew very fast, and then the Lord, when it was nearly finished, said, John, before you close the book, put in one more invitation. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. The Mysteries of the Bible Dr. Talmadge tells the story that one day, while he was bothering his theological professor with questions about the mysteries of the Bible, the latter turned on him and said, Mr. Talmadge, you will have to let God know some things that you do not. The Little Lone One I sometimes think if an angel were to wing its way to heaven and tell them that there was one little child here on earth, it might be a shoeless, coatless street Arab, with no one to lead it to the cross of Christ, and if God were to call the angels round his throne and ask them to go and spend a fifty years in teaching that child, there would be not an angel in heaven, but would respond gladly to the appeal. We should see even Gabriel saying, Let me go and win that soul to Christ. We should see Paul buckling on his old armor again and saying, Let me go back on earth that I may have the joy of leading this little one to his Savior. Ah, we need rousing. There's too much apathy among professing Christians. Let us pray, God, that he may send his Holy Spirit to inspire us with fresh energy and zeal to do his work. Doubting Castle It is the privilege of every child of God to know that he is saved. And yet, I find ever so many people living in doubting castles. Why, it is salvation by doubts nowadays instead of by faith. There are so few that dare to say, I know that my Redeemer liveth. I know in whom I have believed. We find most Christians nowadays shivering and trembling from head to foot. They do not know whether they are saved or not. Faith Bishop Ryle has very well likened faith to a root whose flower is assurance. To have the latter, he says, it is necessary that there must first be a hidden source of faith. Faith is the simplest and most universal experience in the world. Call it by whatever name you may, confidence, trust, or belief, it is inseparable from the human race. The first sign of dawning intelligence in the mind is the exercise of the infant's faith towards those it knows, and its fear towards those it does not know. We cannot even remember when we first began to have faith. Confessing Christ at Home I was preaching in Chicago to a hall full of women one Sunday afternoon, and after the meeting was over, a lady came to me and said that she wanted to talk to me. She said that she would accept Christ, and after some conversation, she went home. I looked for her for a whole week, but didn't see her until the following Sunday afternoon. She came and sat down right in front of me, and her face had such a sad expression. She seemed to have entered into misery instead of the joy of the Lord. After the meeting was over, I went to her and asked her what her trouble was. She said, Oh, Mr. Moody, this has been the most miserable week of my life. I asked her if there was anyone whom she had trouble with or who she could not forgive. She said, no, not that I know of. Well, did you tell your friends about having found the Savior? Indeed, I didn't. I have been all week trying to keep it from them. Well, I said, that is the reason why you have no peace. She wanted to take the crown, but did not want the cross. My friends, you must go by the way of Calvary. If you ever get peace and joy, you must get it at the foot of the cross. Why, she said, if I should go home and tell my infidel husband that I found Christ, I don't know what he will do. I think he would turn me out. Well, I said, go out. She went away and promised that she would tell him. Timon and pale, but she didn't want another wretched week. She was bound to have peace. The next night I gave a lecture to men only, and in the hallway there were 8,000 men and one solitary woman. When I got through and went into the inquiry meeting, I found this lady with her husband. She introduced him to me, he was a doctor and a very influential man, and said he wanted to become a Christian. I took my Bible and told him all about Christ, and he accepted him. I said to her, after it was all over, 
It turned out quite differently from what you'd expected, didn't it? She replied, Yes, I was never so scared in my life. I expected he would do something dreadful, but it turned out so well. She took God's way and got the joy and peace that she sought. How to Settle the Theater Question A lady came to me once and said, Mr. Moody, I wish you would tell me how I can become a Christian. The tears were rolling down her cheeks, and she was in a very favorable mood. But, she said, I don't want to be one of your kind. Well, I asked, have I got any peculiar kind? What is the matter with my Christianity? Well, she said, my father was a doctor and had a large practice, and he used to get so tired that he used to take us to the theater. There used to be a large family of girls, and we had tickets for the theater three or four times a week. I suppose we were there a good deal oftener than we were in church. I'm married to a lawyer, and he has a large practice. He gets so tired that he takes us out to the theater. And she said, I'm far better acquainted with the theater and theater people than that with the church and church people. I don't want to give up the theater. Well, I said, do you ever hear me say anything about theaters? There have been reporters here every day for all the different papers, and they are giving my sermons verbatim in one paper. Have you ever seen anything in these sermons against the theater? She said, no. Well, I said, I have seen you in the audience every afternoon for several weeks, and have you heard me say anything against the theaters? No, she hadn't. Well, I said, what makes you bring them up? Well, I supposed you didn't believe in theaters. What made you think that? Well, she said, do you ever go? No. Why don't you go? Because I have got something better. I would sooner go out into the street and eat dirt than do some of the things I used to do before I became a Christian. Why, she said, I don't understand. Never mind, I said. When Jesus Christ has the preeminence, you will understand it all. He doesn't come down here and say we should go here and we shouldn't go there and lay down a lot of rules, but he laid down great principles. Now, he says, if you love him, you will take delight in pleasing him. And I began to preach Christ to her. The tears started again. She said, I tell you, Mr. Moody, that sermon on the indwelling Christ yesterday afternoon just broke my heart. I admire him and I want to be a Christian, but I don't want to give up the theater. I said, please don't mention them again. I don't want to talk about theaters. I want to talk to you about Christ. So I took my Bible and I read it to her again. But she said again, Mr. Moody, can I go to the theater if I become a Christian? Yes, I said, you can go to the theater just as much as you like if you are a real, true Christian and can go with his blessing. Well, she said, I'm glad you are not so narrow-minded as some. She felt quite relieved to think that she could go to the theater and be a Christian. But I said, if you can go to the theater for the glory of God, keep on going. Only be sure that you go for the glory of God. If you are a Christian, you will be glad to do whatever pleases Him. I really think she became a Christian that day. The burden had gone and there was joy. But just as she was leaving me at the door, she said, I'm not going to give up the theater. In a few days, she came back to me and said, Mr. Moody, I understand all about that theater business now. I went the other night. There was a large party at our house, and my husband wanted us to go, and we went. But when the curtain lifted, everything looked so different. I said to my husband, This is no place for me. This is horrible. I'm not going to stay here. I'm going home. He said, Don't make a fool of yourself. Everyone has heard that you have been converted in the Moody meetings, and if you go out, it will be all throughout fashionable society. I beg of you, don't make a fool of yourself by getting up and going out. But I said, I've been making a fool of myself all my life. Now, the theater hadn't changed, but she had got something better. She was going to overcome the world. They that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. When Christ has the first place in your heart, you are going to get victory. Just do whatever you know will please Him. The great objection I have to these things is that they get the mastery and become a hindrance to spiritual growth. What a sister can do. 
I want to say to young ladies, perhaps you have a godless father or mother or a skeptical brother who's going down through drink, and perhaps there's no one who might reach them but you. How many times a godly, pure young lady has taken the light into some darkened home? Many a home might be lit up with the gospel if the mothers and daughters would only speak the word. The last time Mr. Sankey and myself were in Edinburgh, there were a father, two sisters, and a brother who used to get the morning paper and pick my sermon to pieces. They were indignant to think that the Edinburgh people should be carried away with such preaching. One day, one of the sisters was going by the hall, and she thought she would drop in and see what class of people went there. She happened to take a seat by a godly lady who said to her, I hope you are interested in this work. She tossed her head and said, Indeed I am not. I am disgusted with everything I have seen and heard. Well, said the lady, perhaps you came prejudice. Yes, and the meeting has not removed any of it, but has rather increased it. I have received a great deal of good from them. There is nothing here for me. I don't see how any intellectual person can be interested. To make a long story short, she got the young lady to promise to come back. When the meeting broke up, just a little of the prejudice had worn away. She promised to come back the next day, and then she intended three or four more meetings, and became quite interested. She said nothing to her family, until finally the burden became too heavy, and she told them. They laughed at her, and made her the butt of their ridicule. One day the two sisters were together, and the other said, Now, what have you got in those meetings that you don't have in the first place? I have a peace that I never knew of before. I am at peace with God, myself, and all the world. Did you ever have a little war of your own with your neighbors in your own family? And she said, I have self-control. You know, sister, if you had said half the mean things before I was converted that you have said since, I would have been angry and answered back. But if you remember correctly, I haven't answered once since I have been converted. The sister said, you certainly have something that I have not. The other told her it was for her too, and she brought the sister to the meetings, where she found peace. Like Martha and Mary, they had a brother, but he was a member of the University of Edinburgh. Could he be converted? Could he go to these meetings? It might do for women, but not for him. One night they came home and told him that a chum of his own, a member of the university, had stood up and confessed Christ. And when he sat down, his brother got up and confessed, and so with the third one. When the young man heard it, he said, Do you mean to tell me that they had been converted? Yes. Well, he said, there must be something in it. He put on his hat and his coat and went to see his friends Black. Black got him down to the meetings, and he was converted. He went through to Glasgow and had not been there six weeks when news came that the young man had been stricken down and had died. When he was dying, he called his father to his bedside and said, Wasn't it a good thing that my sisters went to those meetings? Won't you meet me in heaven, father? Yes, my son, I am so glad you are a Christian. That is the only comfort that I have in losing you. I will become a Christian and I will meet you again. I tell this to encourage some sisters to go home and carry the message of salvation. It may be that your brother may be taken away in a few months. How One Man Treated Doubts A wild and prodigal young man who was running a headlong career to ruin came into one of our meetings in Chicago. Whilst endeavoring to bring him to Christ, I quoted this verse to him. Him that cometh unto me I will in no wise cast out. I asked, Do you believe Christ said that? I suppose he did. Suppose he did, do you believe it? I hope so. Hope so, do you believe it? You do your work and the Lord will do his. Just come as you are and throw yourself upon his bosom and he will not cast you out. This man thought it was too simple and easy. At last, light seems to break in upon him, and he seemed to find comfort from it. It was past midnight before he got down on his knees, but down he went and was converted. I said, Now, don't you think you are going to get out of the devil's territory without trouble? The devil will come to you tomorrow morning and say it was all a feeling, that you only imagine you were accepted by God. 
When he does, don't fight him with your own opinions. Fight him with John. Him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. Let that be the sword of the Spirit. I don't believe that any man ever starts to go to Christ, but the devil strives somehow or other to meet him and trip him up. And even after he has come to Christ, the devil tries to assail him with doubts and make him believe there is something wrong in it. The struggle came sooner than I thought in this man's case. When he was on his way home, the devil assailed him. He used this text, but the devil put this thought into his mind. How do you know Christ ever said that after all? Perhaps the translators made a mistake. Into darkness he went again. He was in trouble till about two in the morning. At last he came to this conclusion, and he said, I will believe it anyway, and when I get to heaven, if it isn't true, I'll just tell the Lord that I didn't make the mistake. The translators did. Use or Lose An Eastern allegory runs thus. A merchant going abroad for time gave respectively to two of his friends two sacks of wheat each to take care of against his return. Years passed, and when he came back, he applied for them again. The first took him into a storehouse and showed him his sacks, but they were mildewed and worthless. The other led him out into the open country and pointed to field after field of waving wheat, the produce of the two sacks he was given. And the merchant said, You have been a faithful friend. Give me two sacks of that wheat. The rest shall be yours. Let us put to good use the talents God has given us. The Anchored Boat I once heard of two men who were under the influence of liquor. They came down at night to where their boat was tied. They wanted to return home, so they got in and began to row. They pulled away hard all night, wondering why they never got to the outside of the bay. When the great dawn of morning broke, behold, they had never loosened the mooring line or raised the anchor. That is just the way with many who are striving to enter the kingdom of heaven. They cannot believe because they are tied to this world. Cut the cord. Confess and forsake your sins. Cut the cord. Set yourself free from the clogging weight of earthly things, and you will soon rise heavenward. Not much up there. A friend of mine was once taken by an old man to see his riches. He took him to a splendid mansion and said, This is all mine. He pointed to a little town. This is mine. It is called by my name. He pointed to a rolling prairie. This is all mine. The sun never shone on a finer prairie than this, so fruitful and rich. It is all mine. In another direction, he showed him fertile farms extending for thirty miles. These are all mine. He took him into his grand house, showing him his beautiful pictures, his costly gold plate, his jewels, and still said, These are all mine. This grand hall I have built, it is called by my name. There is my insignia on it. And yet I was once a poor boy. I have made it all myself. The friend looked at him. Well, you've all this on earth, but what have you got up there? Up where, said the old man. Up in heaven. Well, I'm afraid I haven't got much up there. Ah, said my friend, but you've got to die to leave this world. What will you take with you of all these things? You will die a beggar, for all these riches count as nothing in the kingdom of heaven. You will be a pauper, for you have no inheritance with the saints above. Poor old man, he was poor enough in reality, though rich in all the world's goods, burst into tears. He had no hope for the future. In four months' time he was dead, and where is he now? He lived and died without God and without hope in this world or the next. Touching the Spot When a man has broken his arm, the surgeon must find out the exact spot where the fracture is. He feels along and presses gently with his fingers. Is it there? No. Is it there? No. Presently, when the surgeon touches another spot, Ouch! says the man. He has found the broken part and it hurts. It is one thing to hear a man preach down other people's sins. Men will say, this is splendid, and will want all their friends to go and hear the preacher. But let him touch on their individual sins and declare, as Nathan did to David, thou art the man, and they say, I do not like that. The preacher has touched a sore place. The Little Boy and the Big Book 
I like to think of Christ as a burden bearer. A minister was one day moving his library upstairs. As he was going up with the load of books, his little boy came in and was very anxious to help his father. So his father just told him to go and get an armful and bring them upstairs. When the father came back, he met his little fellow about halfway up, tugging away at the biggest book in the library. He couldn't manage to carry it up. It was too big. So he sat down and cried. His father found him and just took him in his arms, book and all, and carried him upstairs. So Christ will carry you in all your burdens, if you but let him. The Invitation to a Saloon Opening they are going to have a great celebration at the opening of a saloon in Billiard Hall in Chicago, in the northern part of the city, where I lived. It was to be a gateway to death and to hell, one of the worst places in Chicago. As a joke, they sent me an invitation to go to the opening. I took the invitation and went down and saw the two men who had the saloon, and I said, Is that a genuine invitation? They said that it was. Thank you, I said. I'll be around, and if there's anything here I don't like, I may have something to say about it. They said, You are not going to preach, are you? I may. We don't want you. We won't let you in. How are you going to keep me out? I asked. There is an invitation. We will put a policeman at the door. What is a policeman going to do with that invitation? We won't let you in. Well, I said, I will be there. I gave them a good scare, and then I said, I will compromise the matter. If you two men will get down here and let me pray with you, I will let you off. I got those two rum sellers down on their knees, one on one side of me and the other on the other, and I prayed God to save their souls and smite their business. One of them had a Christian mother, and he seemed to have some conscience left. After I had prayed, I said, How can you do that business? How can you throw this place open to ruin the young men of Chicago? Within three months, the whole thing smashed up, and one of them was converted shortly after. I've never been invited to a saloon since. Too late. At our church in Chicago, I was closing the meeting one day when a young soldier got up and entreated the people to decide for Christ at once. He said he had just come from a dark scene. A comrade of his who had enlisted with him had a father who was always entreating him to become a Christian, and in reply he would always say that he would when the war was over. At last he was wounded and was put into the hospital but got worse and was gradually sinking. One day, a few hours before he died, a letter came from his sister, but he was too far gone to read it. It was such an earnest letter. The comrade read it to him, but he did not seem to understand it. He was so weak, till it came to the last sentence which said, O oh, my dear brother, when you get this letter, will you not accept your sister's Savior? The dying man sprang up from his cot and said, What do you say? And then, falling back to his pillow, feebly exclaimed, It is too late. It is too late. My dear friends, thank God that it is not too late for you today. The Master is still calling you. Let every one of us, young and old, rich and poor, come to Christ at once, and He will put all your sins away. Don't wait any longer for feeling, but obey at once. You can believe, you can trust, you can lay hold on eternal life if you will. Will you not do it now? Moody Stories by Dwight L. Moody Narrated by David Neche.